My name is Wyatt, and this happened to me in the fall of 2010. I'd been a trucker for almost 15 years. Married, settled, with a couple of kids, and most importantly, off the long-haul routes. Local deliveries were my bread and butter these days. But when an old buddy called in a panic, short a driver with a deadline looming, well, a favor's a favor. The run was straightforward, auto parts from a manufacturing plant in Nebraska straight through to Detroit. Nothing I couldn't handle, even with the tight schedule. First day was uneventful. Wide, flat roads, steady speed, the usual. Managed to make up some lost time, even grabbed dinner at a roadside diner, greasy burger and fries, the kind that sticks to your ribs. Trouble started around three in the morning, somewhere in Iowa. I just crossed the Mississippi, the moon turning the river into a ribbon of silver. Suddenly, the engine started sputtering. Dashboard lights flickered on and off like it was Christmas, and the whole truck began to shudder. I cursed, pulling off onto the shoulder. Had to be a fuel problem, some gunk in the line. A quick fix usually. I climbed down from the cab. The night was silent, the only sound a mournful whippoorwill echoing from the distant tree line. I popped the hood. The engine block was cold to the touch, way too cold. Shivering, more from unease than the crisp night air, I checked the hoses, found nothing. No leaks, clamps tight. Weird. I was about to radio dispatch when I spotted something out of the corner of my eye. A figure, hunched under a tree at the edge of the road. He was watching me. I was sure of it. The moonlight glinted off something he was holding. Something long and curved. A sickle? A prickle of fear snaked down my spine. Gut instinct screamed to get the hell out of there. I slammed the hood down, jumped back into the cab, and mashed the accelerator. The truck coughed, sputtered, then stalled. Dead. Panic flared. I tried the radio. Nothing but static. The lights inside the cab flickered and died, plunging me into near total darkness. I fumbled for my phone, hands shaking. As my fingers brushed the screen, the headlights flared on. Blindingly bright. Right outside the windshield was his face, no more than a foot from the glass. His skin was pale as a corpse, stretched tight across gaunt cheekbones. Deep set, bloodshot eyes burned into mine. His mouth stretched into a grotesque, jagged toothed smile. I screamed, scrambling back against the driver's side door. He slammed a fist against the window, leaving a smear of blood. He raised the sickle, swinging it like a club. Glass exploded inward, showering me with shards. Scrambling blindly, I found the door handle and wrenched it open. I tumbled out, landing hard on the gravel shoulder, and scrambled to my feet. My legs wouldn't hold me, and I fell again. Behind me, I heard the truck door creak open. Desperately, I crawled on hands and knees towards the darkness of the cornfields. Dry stalks crackled under my grasp. I sobbed for breath, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. A shadow fell across me as he stalked closer. Adrenaline gave me a final burst of strength. I pushed myself up and started to run. I heard him behind me, his ragged breathing mingling with my own desperate gasps. I stumbled, fell face first into the hard dirt, the rough stalks scratching against my face. Through tear-blurred eyes, I saw his boots pacing beside me, unhurried. He was playing with me, just like a cat with a mouse. The sickle flashed in the moonlight, arcing downwards. I screamed again, a raw, animal sound, and rolled desperately to the side. The blade sliced through the air where I'd been a heartbeat before. Another swing, then another. Miraculously, 
I managed to evade his clumsy blows. But I couldn't keep dodging forever. I was exhausted, and he, he wasn't even winded. Resigned, I closed my eyes, waiting for the final blow that would end it all. Yet the expected impact never came. Silence descended, broken only by my ragged gasps. Confused, I forced my eyes open. The cornfield stood eerily still. He was gone. I lay there, trembling uncontrollably, waiting for him to reappear, the sickle poised to strike. But after an eternity of strained silence, I realized he wasn't coming back. Slowly, I pushed myself into a sitting position. My clothes were torn and coated in dirt and sweat, and my skin crawled with a mixture of fear and revulsion. The headlights of my truck still glowed faintly, casting long shadows across the field. In that dim light, I saw something that chilled me to the core. Footprints. Leading away from the truck and towards the tree line. My attacker's footprints. But they weren't human. Each imprint was massive, clawed, and vaguely hoof-shaped. They cut a path through the cornstalks, disappearing into the inky blackness of the woods beyond. My mind reeled, refusing to process what I was seeing. This was no man, but something else, something inhuman. Terror fueled a fresh surge of adrenaline. I stumbled to my feet, my only thought to get as far away from there as possible. Ignoring the abandoned truck, I took off across the field, the brittle stalks whipping against my legs, the cold night air burning in my lungs. I didn't stop running until the first hint of dawn tinged the horizon. Eventually, I stumbled onto a highway. A passing car spotted me, the driver's face a mask of horror at my disheveled and bloodied appearance. They called the cops and an ambulance. I was taken to a hospital in the nearest town, where I recounted my ordeal to a skeptical sheriff. The police searched the area around my truck but found nothing. No blood, no weapon, no sign of the man with the sickle, no sign of anything but those chilling, inhuman footprints. They wrote me off, attributed the events to exhaustion, stress, and maybe some bad diner food. The doctors pumped me full of sedatives and anti-anxiety meds, trying to quiet my frantic ravings about the creature in the cornfield. I never went back for my truck. They towed it to an impound lot, where it likely sits to this day. And though the pills helped dull the terror, I haven't had a single night of restful sleep since. Every rustle of leaves, every shadow, brings back the image of those bloodshot eyes and the glint of that wicked blade. In the dark, when the fear takes hold, I swear I can hear his ragged breaths whispering in my ear. The incident ruined my life. The trucking company fired me. Friends looked at me with pity. Even my wife started sleeping in the spare room, unable to bear my sudden flinches and panic screams in the middle of the night. The only people who believed me were those I found online. Others who had terrifying brushes with the unexplained along the back roads and highways of America. Drivers, hitchhikers, lone travelers who had caught a glimpse of something monstrous lurking just off the pavement. We traded our stories, sharing tips on how to stay safe. We formed a loose network, warning each other about reported sightings. We knew the cops wouldn't understand, even if there was hard proof. The disappearances continued scattered across the vast stretches of rural America. Each vanished vehicle or abandoned roadside campsite became another chilling tale shared on our forums. We also knew that many more victims never had the chance to share their stories. I decided to share mine to warn others, to let them know that even familiar routes can hide unimaginable dangers. For years, I had thought of those lonely highways as safe, the wide open spaces as places of freedom. Now I knew they could harbor a darkness far worse than any human evil. 
I never drove a truck again. I couldn't face getting behind the wheel. But I didn't simply run and hide. Fueled by a mix of fear and desperate determination, I set about gathering information, researching every tale of backwoods oddities. If I couldn't stop these things, I could at least shine a light into the shadows, let others know they weren't alone in seeing the horrors out there. Some nights, I think I catch a glimpse of him. In the ragged figure hunched on a street corner. In the reflection of a passing car window. I see those burning eyes. It's a constant reminder that the thing in the cornfield could be anywhere, still moving, still hunting. And that the next time, I might not be so lucky. My name is Rayford, and this happened to me back in the spring of 1991. Been trucking since I was old enough to hold the steering wheel. Seen just about every back road off the interstate from coast to coast. I was a seasoned driver, with a safety record I was proud of. Thought I'd seen it all, but I learned some things can't be explained, even by a man who's logged a million miles. This particular run had me hauling a load of furniture down to Dallas. Mostly routine stuff, nothing special. But when an urgent shipment for Detroit popped up, I agreed to take it. Meant cutting across a remote part of the Arkansas Ozarks. But the extra cash was too sweet to resist. That was a decision I'd regret for a long time to come. The first sign of trouble was just a busted taillight blew out somewhere along a stretch of winding two-lane road deep in the woods. Sun was setting, and I didn't like the idea of driving at night on those mountain curves. Figured it was worth stopping to fix, even if it meant getting in a few hours late. I found a turnout with enough space to maneuver the rig onto the gravel shoulder. The Ozarks in twilight were beautiful, all rolling hills and pine trees turning blue in the fading light. If I hadn't been in such a hurry, I might have appreciated it. But all I felt was a crawling unease. The place was too still, the air too thick. Even the usual buzz of insects seemed strangely absent. I had the toolbox open and was digging around for spare bulbs when I heard a twig snap somewhere behind the truck. Whirling around, I half expected to see a deer or wild hog. But there was nothing there. The fading sunlight threw long, distorted shadows from the trees, and for a panicked moment, I thought I saw a figure melt back into the darkness. Must be getting spooked by the shadows. I mumbled to myself, shaking my head to clear it. My hands were trembling as I fumbled with the taillight assembly cursing under my breath. I swore there was someone watching me. Finally, the new bulb slotted into place. I flicked on the lights, relieved to see the rear of the rig illuminated once again. As I shut the toolbox and climbed back into the cab, something caught my eye. A splash of red high up on the hillside, almost hidden by the trees. It looked like blood. Fear spiked through me. I started the engine and took off, tires kicking up gravel. As the truck lurched forward, I caught another glimpse through the rear window. This time, there was no mistaking it. A figure hunched on the hillside. Tall, thin, and stark naked. His skin reflected the last of the sunlight like it was wet. He was holding something long and pointed, a spear perhaps and he was staring straight at me. I didn't look back again. I slammed my foot down on the accelerator, pushing the old truck faster than it was probably meant to go. Up ahead, the road split at a fork. I barely slowed down, taking the right turn without hesitation. Better to add a few hours to my drive than face whatever was back there in the hills. As the miles passed, my panic began to subside. Logically, I knew it was probably just some hillbilly out hunting. 
but a deep, primal instinct told me something else, something darker. I kept picturing that hunched figure and its blood-red skin, a vision burned into my memory. I eventually found a truck stop to lay over for the night. I barely ate, couldn't sleep. The rustle of sheets in the hotel room sounded like someone creeping across the woods, and I swore every car headlight was his eyes peering at me from the darkness. I left before dawn, the rising sun no comfort against the fear in my bones. News reports on the radio finally snapped me out of my fugue. Local story about a missing family somewhere up in those Ozark foothills. Their campsite was abandoned, tent ripped apart. A search was underway, but the report made it seem like the cops expected the worst. The newscaster mentioned the family's last name, the Winstons. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I'd seen a personalized bumper sticker on the back of their van, a minivan, the kind families use, when I passed them earlier in the day at a gas station. They were ahead of me on that same, desolate road where I'd seen that figure. My name is Harlan Coburn, and this happened to me back in 2008. I was a truck driver, had been for more years than I care to count. I loved being on the road, especially those long stretches out west. Gives a man a chance to clear his head, you know? That year, I had a route that took me through Nevada. Reno to Elko, then up to Idaho and across. Beautiful drive even in the stretches where there ain't nothing but sagebrush for miles on end. Now, there's one spot in particular, along Highway 80, that always gave me a weird feeling. It's a long, lonely stretch between Winnemucca and Battle Mountain. Not much out there but scrubland and a few tumble-down ranches sell service gets spotty, too. The kind of place where, if you break down, you're well and truly on your own. One late afternoon in August, I was hauling a load of industrial parts eastbound on Highway 80. Sun was getting low, casting long shadows across the desert. I still had a good few hours before I could stop for the night, and I was starting to think about finding a place to pull over. As I passed one of those old, rusted-out, branch for sale, signs, a shiver ran down my spine. The usual feeling of unease about this place was stronger than ever. I tried to push it out of my mind, focus on the road. But then I saw it, a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. Something big had darted across the road, maybe a hundred yards ahead. I slammed on the brakes, the truck lurching beneath me. Heart pounding, I scanned the roadside. Nothing. Just the same old sagebrush, and the bleached bones of some poor critter the buzzards had picked clean. I chalked it up to nerves, the desert playing tricks on my eyes. But as I got the truck moving again, the feeling that I wasn't alone out there only grew stronger. I kept glancing at the rearview mirror, half expecting to see a vehicle tailing me. There was nothing. Still, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. About a mile down the road, there was a turnout, a dusty patch of gravel just wide enough for a semi to pull over. I decided, screw it, I was stopping, even if it was a bit early. Needed to stretch my legs, walk this weird feeling off. As I pulled the truck over and killed the engine, silence descended. That oppressive, desert silence that rings in your ears. I hopped down from the cab, the hot asphalt radiating through the soles of my boots. I walked to the back of the trailer, checked the seals like I always do, more to give myself something to focus on than out of any real concern. Everything was in order. Glancing around, there wasn't another soul in sight. I took a deep breath, trying to calm my nerves. Figured maybe some coffee from my thermos would do me good. 
I was just turning back towards the cab when something caught my eye. A glint of metal in the brush a few yards off the road. Now, I'm not a superstitious man, but something gave me pause. I thought about just getting back in my truck and driving off. But curiosity, that old itch, it got the better of me. I took a few steps closer. And that's when I saw the old car. It was half hidden by the sage, like someone had driven it out there and just abandoned it. Didn't look like it had been there long, though the paint, faded as it was, wasn't coated in dust. I got a bad feeling standing there, like a warning bell ringing somewhere in the back of my head. Maybe it was just the isolation of the place, starting to get to me. Then I saw something else. Dark stains on the driver's side door. Blood stains? My stomach tightened. I edged closer, the rational part of my brain screaming at me to turn and run, get the hell out of there. And there, right there in the middle of all those dark stains, was a handprint. Small and smeared, a child's handprint. That was it. The logical part of my brain just shut off. I bolted back to my truck, fumbling with the keys, hands shaking. I threw myself into the cab, slammed the door, and fired up the engine. I threw the truck in gear and tore out of that turnout, spraying gravel in my wake. I didn't look back. I put my foot down and didn't stop speeding until I reached the outskirts of Battle Mountain. I pulled into the first gas station I saw, feeling sick and shaky all over. I thought about calling the cops telling them what I'd seen, but what could I really say? Guy gets spooked by a derelict car in the desert. They'd probably laugh in my face. But the longer I sat there, staring blankly at the worn pumps and cracked pavement, the more that image of the handprint burned in my mind. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911 told the dispatcher about the abandoned car, the stains, the handprint. She tried to sound reassuring, said they'd send someone out to check it out, but I could tell she didn't take me seriously. I hung up, feeling stupid and helpless. Part of me wanted to drive back there myself, try to make sense of it. But another, much larger part was terrified of what I might find. So I got back on the highway and drove through the night, not stopping until I crossed the state line into Idaho. It's been years now, but I can still see that handprint clear as day. Did someone hurt a kid out there? Are they still out there, maybe? To this day, I don't know the answer. I never heard anything more about it. Nobody called to say they found a body, or even the car. Every now and again, I think about going back, searching for some clue that could make sense of it all. But the thought of setting foot back in that desolate stretch of Nevada, of what I might uncover, it makes my blood run cold. Sometimes, maybe it's better to leave things unknown. Just drive on and try to forget. But the memory of that handprint, I doubt it'll ever leave me. Each time I pass through that stretch, I wonder, is he still watching, whoever left that mark? Does he stalk truckers passing by, biding his time? Every rustle of the wind sounds like a footstep coming towards me. My name is Ezekiel Barnes, but most folks just call me Zeke. This happened to me way back in 94. Been a trucker for longer than I care to admit. Pays the bills, keeps a roof over my head, even if said roof is the cab of my rig most nights. I ain't complaining. The open road has its own kind of peace. That year, I landed a cross-country route, California to New York. I was excited I'd never driven that far east. Started off smooth, 
Sunny Days Through the Desert, a good audiobook keeping me company. Come evening of the third day, though, things took a turn. I was rolling through Wyoming, smack in the middle of nowhere. Mountains on one side, empty plains on the other. Sun was dipping low, shadows stretching long across the highway. Now Wyoming has those rest stops marked by signs, but they're few and far between. Mostly just patches of gravel with maybe a picnic table if you're lucky. I was getting tired, figured I'd pull over at the next one, get some shut-eye. Well, the next one didn't show up for a good hour, and by then, I was starting to get a prickly feeling at the back of my neck. Wasn't sure why just one of those gut instincts you learned to listen to after years on the asphalt. Finally, a sign for a rest area appeared. I swung the truck in, relieved to be stopping. Place was deserted, not another vehicle in sight. That struck me as strange, but mostly, I was just bone-weary. I figured a few hours' sleep would wash the unease away. So, I parked, climbed into the bunk, and closed my eyes. It couldn't have been more than an hour before a noise jolted me awake. A scraping, tapping sound coming from the side of the trailer. I froze. My heart pounded in my ears. Had to be an animal, right? A raccoon or something messing around looking for scraps. Nothing to worry about. Then it came again. Scraping, and a thud, like something bumping against the metal. Louder this time. I could picture something nosing around the back of the truck, where the seal for the cargo hold was. And suddenly... Fear clenched my gut like an icy fist. This wasn't some damn raccoon. I sat up, every muscle tense. There wasn't a gun on board trucking company had strict rules about that, but I did have a hefty wrench under the bunk. I grabbed it, hand shaking. The thumping noise came again, followed by a sound I'll never forget. A kind of whimpering. Like a hurt animal, or worse, a crying child. That's when I knew something was seriously wrong. I inched my way to the cab window, trying not to make a sound. I peered through the cracked curtain, scanning the shadows that pooled under the dim rest stop lights. At first, I didn't see anything. Then, a shape detached itself from the darkness under the trailer. Tall and thin, moving on all fours with a strange, jerky gait. It wore ragged clothes, and its hair was a tangled mat that hung down over its face. The rest, the rest was hard to look at. Its limbs were too long, the joints bent at unnatural angles. It was all wrong, a twisted mockery of a human being. And it was heading straight for the back of the truck. A wave of nausea washed over me. I wanted to throw up, scream drive a thousand miles an hour in any direction that was away from this thing. But some terrified, animal part of me knew that making noise would be a death sentence. I stayed pressed against the window, barely breathing. The thing reached the rear of the trailer. It stopped. Silence fell. Then, slowly, the thing began to circle the truck. The whimpering sounds continued, punctuated by that horrible scraping as its long, bony fingers raked against the metal. My whole body was on fire with fear, sweat trickling down my spine. Minutes crawled by. The thing circled the truck once, twice, three times. I don't know what it was looking for, or if it even knew I was inside. But something told me it wasn't going to give up. I started the engine as quietly as I could, hands trembling on the ignition key. The truck roared to life, and the creature jolted back from the trailer with a screech. I took a gamble and flipped on the headlights. For a brief, blinding moment, those twisted limbs and hollow eyes were seared into my vision. Then it was gone, vanishing into the darkness with a speed that defied its warped shape. I didn't hesitate. 
hit the gas, tearing out of that cursed rest stop as fast as the truck would go. I drove through the night, never stopping for so much as a coffee refill. I couldn't shake the image of that thing, the hunched form, the too wide grin full of needle teeth, the whimpering. God, that horrible, hungry whimpering. My name's Marcus Tillman. Been a trucker for longer than makes sense to admit. I ain't much for fancy living a hot meal, the comfort of my own bed, that's enough for me. But this year, 2002, it all went sideways. Landed a route that took me through Arizona. Now, that stretch of I-10 between Phoenix and Tucson? Beautiful in its own way, yeah, but also lonely as hell. Miles of saguaros and shimmering sand with nothing in sight but the occasional gas station or roadside diner. Cell service gets real spotty out there, too. The kind of place where you start feeling like the last man on earth. It was early evening when trouble rolled in. I was hauling a load of electronics and had a deadline to make, so I was pushing myself hard. Had some classic rock blasting to keep me company. That old CCR song about a bad moon rising playing just as the sun dipped below the horizon. Then, out of nowhere, a tire blew. The truck swerved, and for a heart-stopping moment, I thought I was a goner. But by some miracle, I managed to wrestle the rig to the side of the road. Cursing and sweating, I climbed out to assess the damage. Of course, I didn't have a spare. Wonderful. I did what anyone would, fired up the CB radio. Figured maybe another trucker within range could lend a hand. Nothing but static. Tried cursing again, but that didn't fix the tire either. Then I remembered, there was a dusty turnoff less than a mile back. Maybe one of those roadside places could help. Leaving the truck on the shoulder with the hazard lights blinking, I started walking back the way I had come. The back of my neck prickled uncomfortably. The desert twilight was throwing long, spooky shadows, and the wind hissed through the mesquite-like whispers. I started to pick up the pace. I hadn't gone far when I saw a glimmer of light up ahead. My heart leapt with relief. Must be the place, I thought. But as I got closer, something seemed off. It wasn't a proper building, looked more like an abandoned trailer or RV out on its lonesome. Even stranger, there was a campfire flickering next to it, even though the temperature was still in the triple digits. Hello? I called out, approaching cautiously. Nobody answered. The campfire crackled, and an acrid smell hung in the air. Something about the whole scene sent a chill down my spine. I should have turned around right then, listened to my gut. But I was desperate. As I drew closer, a figure rose from the shadows beside the campfire. Tall, rail-thin, he was dressed in faded jeans and a flannel shirt that hung loose on his skeletal frame. His face, God, I'll never forget that face. Sunken cheeks, skin tight and weathered like old leather. His eyes were the worst, though. Like empty sockets in the dim light, boring into me. He didn't speak, just stared with that unsettling gaze. A shard of panic sliced through me, and I took a step back. Hey, sorry to bother you. I stammered, my voice suddenly hoarse. Got a flat, just up the road. You think, you got a phone I could use? Still, the man said nothing. He just tilted his head slightly, like a bird sizing up its prey. That was when I noticed the other thing. His hands. Too long, the fingers ending in what looked like dirty, broken claws. And there was something smeared across his palms. Something dark and wet. Blood, the word whispered through my head, followed by a jolt of primal fear. 
I turned and ran. I didn't look back. Stumbled and sprinted blindly, the sound of my ragged breathing and blood pounding in my ears. I could imagine those bony hands reaching for me, those claws raking down my back. The truck seemed miles away when I finally broke out of the brush and onto the asphalt. I fumbled with the door handle, clawed my way into the cab, and slammed the lock down. Through the windshield, I saw the thin figure emerge from the darkness. He stood at the edge of the desert, silhouetted against the faint glow of the campfire, just watching. I started the engine with shaking hands, threw the truck into gear, and floored it. The headlights cut a swath through the night, and I didn't stop speeding until I reached the outskirts of Tucson. First gas station I found, I pulled in and practically collapsed out of the truck. My whole body trembled, and sweat soaked through my shirt. I went inside, found a payphone, and dialed 911 with fumbling fingers. Tried to explain what had happened, the man at the campfire, but the words stumbled out in a jumbled rush. I could tell the dispatcher didn't take me seriously, figured I was just a spook driver seeing things that weren't there. When the state troopers finally rolled in, I took them back to the place where I'd seen the trailer and the campfire. There was nothing left. Not a single trace. The cops exchanged a skeptical look, and I knew what they were thinking. Trucker on too many long hauls, finally cracked under the pressure. Didn't bother arguing. I just wanted to get the hell away from that godforsaken stretch of desert. They gave me a ride back to my truck, helped me get a tow service out, and sent me on my way. I finished the delivery under a haze of exhaustion and lingering fear. Every rustle of the wind, every shadow cast by the headlights, made me jump. But I pushed on, telling myself it was over, that I'd been imagining things. It wasn't over. A few weeks later, I was on a different route, up in Colorado this time. Stopped for the night in a small town off the interstate. Figured a proper meal and a bed would do me wonders after the ordeal in Arizona. Parked the truck in the motel's lot and went inside to register. As I was filling out the paperwork, my eye caught a newspaper spread open on the counter. A headline screamed at me. Hiker found dead. Possible animal attack. I felt a wave of nausea. My hand shook as I reached for the paper and read the article. The victim had been found in a remote area of the Rockies, his body. The description chilled me to the bone. Mutilated would be the right word, torn apart. The coroner couldn't identify what had done it, just that it wasn't any predator they'd ever encountered. And that was when the connection hit me with the force of a sledgehammer. The man I'd seen in the desert, those long, clawed hands, the blood, it wasn't my imagination, not a hallucination brought on by exhaustion. He was real. He was something else, something monstrous, and now, it seemed, he was on the move. I never went back to Arizona, refused any route that might take me near that stretch of I-10. It cost me some jobs, made things tight financially for a while. I didn't care. Better to be broke than end up like that poor hiker in Colorado. But I made a mistake. Got too complacent. About a year later, I took a run down to Texas. Figured enough time had passed. Whatever that thing was, it would be long gone. I was wrong. Driving back, I needed to stop for fuel in the middle of nowhere. West Texas. One of those lonely, desolate gas stations with flickering fluorescent lights and tumbleweeds blowing across the cracked pavement. I filled up the tank, grabbed a coffee to go, figuring I'd make a quick pit stop before pushing on. As I was heading back to the truck, I saw something flicker in my peripheral vision. I froze. Just beyond the dumpster, a tall, emaciated figure crouched in the shadows. It turned its head, 
and those hollow eyes locked with mine. A scream caught in my throat. It was him. That unnatural, bone-thin body, those clawed hands. He shouldn't have been possible, yet there he was. This time, he didn't just watch. The creature lunged, moving not like a man but some kind of twisted spider. I ran for the truck, fumbling with the keys, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. Just as I managed to yank the door open, those claws raked across the metal, leaving deep gashes in the paint. I slammed the truck into gear and gunned the engine. I glanced in the rearview mirror as I pulled away. The creature was standing by the dumpster, its head cocked to the side, watching me disappear down the road. I reported it, of course. Told the local sheriff everything, even though I knew how it would sound. He didn't laugh outright, bless him, but I could see the disbelief in his eyes. They did a cursory search, found nothing, and the case went cold. To this day, I don't know what that thing is, or why it seems fixated on me. I try not to think about it, but some nights, when the wind howls outside and I'm all alone on the road, the fear creeps back in. He's still out there, I know he is. Waiting. My name's Elijah Reed. I've been driving trucks for more years than I want to count. Pays the bills, keeps a roof over my head. I ain't never been one for fancy things. Just give me good food, a little company now and then, and the open road. But this thing, it changed me. Happened back in 2011, and it still haunts my nights. I was doing long hauls at the time, mostly running routes between California and the Midwest. That summer, I had a load of produce headed for Chicago. The trip out was smooth sailing, delivered my cargo on time, and started heading back west. Now, there are different ways to skirt the Rockies, but I always favored I-70 through Colorado. Sure, it meant dealing with mountain passes, but the scenery made up for it. The trouble started when I was just on the western slope of the mountains. Sun starting to set, casting those long, purple shadows across the asphalt. I'd planned on making it to Grand Junction for the night, but my fuel gauge was telling me otherwise. I figured I'd keep going until I found a gas station or rest stop before pulling over. Big mistake. I didn't pass another soul for miles in either direction. Nothing but those rolling hills getting swallowed up by darkness. My headlights cut a narrow path through the growing gloom, and that's when I saw the hitchhiker. He was standing a ways off the side of the road, just this long, lean silhouette against the darkening sky. Now, I don't usually pick up hitchhikers. There's too much risk, not just for me, but for them, being out in the middle of nowhere at night. But something about this guy tugged at me. Maybe it was the way his backpack sagged, like he was carrying a heavy burden. Or maybe it was just that nagging feeling of wrongness, a prickle at the back of my neck that always warns me when things are about to go south. I slowed the truck and pulled up beside him. He turned then, and the light caught his face just enough for me to catch my breath. I've seen some rough-looking characters on the road, but this... His skin was ashen, stretched tight over bones that seemed too prominent. His eyes were sunken pits, burning with a strange, hungry light. And when he grinned, his teeth were wrong. Too many, too sharp. He gave me the creeps, but something kept me from hitting the gas. Thanks for stopping, he said, his voice a dry rasp. Where you headed? I asked, trying to keep the unease from showing. West, he rasped. Just west. That wasn't much to go on, but I gestured for him to climb in. He slid into the passenger seat, 
his bony frame barely making a dent in the upholstery. As soon as the door closed, the stench hit me. Like rotten fruit and something worse underneath, the smell of decay. I tried to ignore it, focused on the road ahead. It didn't take long for my unease to grow into outright fear. This guy, he didn't say much, but there was an intensity crackling around him that set my teeth on edge. I tried to make small talk, but every word felt like pulling teeth. He just sat there, staring out the window with that unblinking, hungry look. After what felt like an eternity, we passed a sign that lifted my spirits. Gas and food, twenty-five miles. Relief washed over me. At least I could refuel, and maybe ditch this creep at the next stop before things got any weirder. The gas station materialized out of the darkness like a beacon, lonely and decrepit under the harsh glare of the floodlights. I pulled in, trying to stifle a sigh of relief. The hitchhiker didn't say a word, just watched me with those hollow eyes. Listen, I started not meeting his gaze. This is as far as you go. I'm gonna fill up, use the restroom. But then, you need to find another ride. He just grinned, those sharp teeth glinting in the dim light of the cab. And that's when I saw them. His hands. Long, gnarled, with fingertips that tapered into jagged points that looked more like talons than nails. And they were stained a rusty color, blood. Panic surged through me. I lunged for the door handle and bolted from the truck. As I fumbled with the gas pump, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm in my ears, I heard him climbing out behind me. I didn't look back. Finished fueling up as fast as I could, then slammed the gas cap on and jumped back in the truck, locking the doors. Through the windshield, I saw him standing in the forecourt, his head tilted like he was listening to something only he could hear. My hand shook so hard I could barely get the key in the ignition. I started the engine, the roar echoing in the silence of the night. The hitchhiker turned towards the sound, his gaze locking onto me. Then he started walking. Not a hurried walk, but an unhurried, predatory saunter that sent chills down my spine. I slammed the truck into gear and tore out of the parking lot back onto the highway. A desperate glance into the rearview mirror showed him standing at the edge of the forecourt, watching me go. For a moment, the relief was overwhelming. Then I looked ahead and my blood ran cold. Directly in my path, an elk had wandered onto the road. It was a magnificent beast, silhouetted against the oncoming headlights but I knew I couldn't swerve at this speed. Instinctively, I hit the brakes, bracing for the impact. The truck swerved violently as the tires screeched on the asphalt. There was a sickening thud, then darkness. I came to, hanging upside down, the smell of gasoline sharp in my nostrils. Groggily, I undid the seat belt and dropped to the mangled floor of the cab. Pain throbbed through my body, but I had to get out of there. I scrambled to my feet, forcing open the crumpled door and crawling to safety. The truck lurched, flames starting to lick at the wreckage. Staggering back, I saw the elk lying motionless on the road. Had I hit it and then overturned? My head spun and nausea welled up in my throat. It was then through the haze of pain and confusion, that something registered, a sound that didn't belong. A dry rustling, like dead leaves scraping against concrete. Then he emerged from the shadows, the emaciated hitchhiker, his eyes glowing like embers. He approached the wreckage of my truck, peering into the shattered windows. My legs refused to obey me. I stood frozen in horror as he reached in and started methodically moving the twisted metal aside. He wanted something, or someone. Me. In that moment of desperation, the primal need for survival kicked in. I stumbled back, 
turned, and ran blindly into the night. Each jagged breath burned in my lungs, and the sound of his footsteps seemed to echo in every rustle of the wind. I didn't know where I was going, only that I had to get away. Hours later, as the first hint of dawn tinged the sky, I emerged from the foothills onto a dirt road. I was bruised, bleeding, and utterly exhausted, but alive. Aching and disoriented, I stumbled along the road until I came across a battered old farmhouse and collapsed on the porch. The farmer who found me called the cops and paramedics. The wreckage of my truck was located. They found the carcass of the elk but no sign of a hitchhiker. Police searched the area, questioned me extensively. Of course, I couldn't give them a coherent description. Told them I'd taken my eyes off the road for a second and hit the elk. They just exchanged exasperated looks, figuring I was a traumatized driver trying to deflect blame. In the hospital, they found no trace of drugs or alcohol in my system. I insisted I had picked up a hitchhiker but there were no witnesses. No other drivers had passed through that remote stretch of highway around the time of my accident. My story was dismissed. Delirium from the crash, they said. Maybe even a concussion, causing hallucinations. I knew what I saw, but nobody believed me. They treated my physical injuries and sent me on my way. I never went back to being a long-haul trucker. Couldn't bear the thought of those isolated roads, the vast expanses of empty landscape. Instead, I took up local deliveries, working day shifts and sleeping in my own bed at night. But the memory of that night never truly left me. I started carrying a gun, checking the back seat religiously before getting into my car. Every time I passed a lone figure on the side of the road, my pulse quickened. I lost count of the nights I woke in a cold sweat, the image of those hollow eyes and sharp teeth seared into my mind. There were news reports, disappearances, bodies found torn apart in wilderness areas. I tried to convince myself it was just coincidence, wild animal attacks, but deep down, I knew better. He was out there, still hunting. And somewhere inside, a chilling thought festered. What if he wasn't hunting just anything, but hunting me? Some might say I'm a broken man, haunted by trauma and the delusions it brings. I can't argue with that. I may never be able to shake the fear that has settled in my bones. All I know is this. There are things in this world that defy explanation, monstrous things that lurk in the shadows. And sometimes, on those long, sleepless nights... I feel those hungry eyes searching for me in the darkness. My name's Colton Webb, and I've been a truck driver for longer than makes sense to admit. Seen a lot, done even more, and let me tell you, the open road ain't always what folks imagine. Glamour there ain't, but there's a kind of freedom to it, too. Least there was, until this happened. Now, the only thing I feel driving is fear, and that started back in 2019. I mostly haul produce cross-country. That summer, I had a run taking strawberries from California all the way to Florida. Started off as smooth as pie, nothing out of the ordinary. Well, that is until I reached the Texas Panhandle. That stretch of I-40 can get desolate in a hurry. Miles of scrubland flat as a pancake, dotted with those old-timey roadside motels and the occasional rusted-out gas station. It was late evening when I crossed the state line. Figured I'd push on for a couple more hours, find a truck stop to hole up in for the night. I was listening to some old Willie Nelson tunes on the radio, voice crackling through the speakers, when I saw them up ahead. A pair of figures standing off to the side of the road, 
just a couple of silhouettes against the deepening twilight. One tall and skinny as a beanpole, the other short and hunched. Now, I ain't the type to pick up hitchhikers. There's company policy against it, for one, and there's too many crazies out there in the world, for another. But something about these two pulled at me. Maybe it was the way the setting sun cast such long shadows that they looked almost unreal, like warped paintings stretched across the asphalt. Or maybe it was that gnawing loneliness that creeps in after too many days on the road on your lonesome. Whatever it was, I did something I always told myself I'd never do. I pulled over. My rig rolled to a stop, the rumble of the diesel engine cutting through the silence. Dust swirled around my headlights, painting the figures in an eerie amber glow. As they approached, I could see they were both older men. The tall one was bone-thin, with sallow skin pulled tight over his skull. His eyes were sunken and darted nervously. He wore tattered jeans and a faded band t-shirt that hung on him like a sack. The second man was as round as the first was narrow. His gray hair was a bushy halo around his head, and he had a wispy beard that nearly reached his belly. He wore overalls, the straps dangling, and carried a bulging backpack that looked heavier than he was. Appreciate the ride. The skinny one rasped as they climbed into the passenger's side. His voice had a twangy, sing-song quality that put me on edge. Where you headed? I asked trying to ignore the prickling unease settling over me. Just east, said the round one, his voice soft and surprisingly gentle. Far as you're going. I introduced myself, and they gave me names Virgil and Clem. The conversation was stilted. I made a few attempts at small talk, but only got short answers that barely filled the silence. Mostly, they just sat there, staring silently ahead at the darkening highway. The air grew thick with a tension I couldn't place. I started to regret stopping. An hour or so later, the lights of a truck stop glimmered up ahead. Figured I could use a break myself, and maybe find a reason to ditch these two. I pulled in and parked, hoping they'd take the hint and find another ride. But when I turned to look at them... Virgil just gave me that unnerving grin, and Clem smiled, his teeth disconcertingly small and pointed. Mind if we ride a bit further? Virgil asked. Not hungry quite yet. His tone wasn't threatening, but I felt it anyway. Against my better judgment, I nodded and shifted the rig back into gear. We rolled back onto the highway, leaving the truck stop behind. A sense of impending doom settled over me. Virgil and Clem seemed to relax, though. Clem dug around in his backpack, pulling out a leather-bound flask. Want some? He held it out to me, a hopeful gleam in his eye. I declined politely, but Virgil snatched the flask and took a long swig. He made a satisfied sound and then let out a sigh. That's when I noticed the smell. It had been lingering since they got in, faint at first, but it was growing stronger. A metallic, rotten smell, like blood left in the sun too long. What is that smell? I blurted out, unable to control myself any longer. Virgil and Clem exchanged glances. Virgil tilted his head, his grin widening unnervingly. Then, in that strange, sing-song voice, he said, Smells like supper time, friend. My blood ran cold. I knew, with a bone-deep certainty, that I had made a terrible, terrible mistake. You boys gonna pull over soon? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady, but a tremor crept in. Virgil just chuckled, a dry, scraping sound, and took another swig of whatever was in that flask. What's the rush? Plenty of road left to travel. Panic started to gnaw at me. My eyes darted to the rearview mirror, the side mirrors, seeking any kind of escape. 
There was nothing but darkness stretching back the way we'd come, the occasional car flying past in the opposite lane. Out here, a scream wouldn't even echo off the hills before it faded away. The miles dragged on. Clem started to hum softly under his breath, a mournful tune that didn't have any words, just a melody that chilled me to the bone. Virgil tapped his long, bony fingers against the dashboard, the nails ragged and caked with something that looked suspiciously like dried blood. I tried focusing on the road, on the hypnotic rhythm of the dotted lines flickering past in the headlights, but all I could see were those smiles, those two sharp teeth. Then it came to me. My gun. They hadn't patted me down, figured some old truck driver wouldn't be a threat. They were wrong. I kept my point three eight under the seat, locked in a box just in case. If I could just get to it. How about this spot? Clem chirped, his voice breaking through my thoughts. Looks mighty fine. Panic threatened to choke me. My hands were slick with sweat on the steering wheel. I pulled over onto the shoulder, the truck lurching to a stop. Now or never. As inconspicuously as I could, I slid my hand down towards the floor, trying to unlatch the box. If they noticed, it was over. But they were still chattering, Virgil passing the flask back and forth with Clem, oblivious. My fingers found the latch, flipped it open. My heart pounded in my ears as I eased the gun out and slipped it under my leg. Virgil was still swigging from the flask as I shifted position, bringing the gun to bear. My hand shook, the adrenaline rush making it hard to get a steady aim. You boys gonna get out, I said, my voice rough and barely above a whisper. And you gonna walk real slow. Virgil swiveled his head to look at me, eyes wide and shocked. Clem froze, the flask halfway to his lips. Then Virgil started to laugh, that same dry, grating cackle. You think that little pea shooter scares me, old man? He sneered. I gritted my teeth. Out of the truck, I said again, raising my voice. Now. Slowly, Virgil put the flask down, still grinning. Clem lowered his hands from his backpack, giving me a curious, almost pitying look. Don't do this, Virgil drawled. Ain't no way this ends good for you. I said get out. I waved the gun, my hands starting to cramp from the string. Virgil sighed. Fine, like you say. He opened the door and slid out, followed a moment later by Clem. But neither moved away from the truck. Virgil just stretched lazily, like a cat waking from a nap. Clem hefted his backpack, a silent challenge in his eyes. I knew I should have just backed out, driven into the night. But the fear was turning into rage now, hot and righteous. These two, whatever they were, they didn't get to just walk away after terrorizing me. I stepped out of the truck and aimed the gun, hands shaking but steadier now that the target wasn't inches away. Start walking. My voice was hoarse, but it carried. Virgil and Clem exchanged another look. Then, slowly, Clem started to shuffle down the shoulder of the highway, heading east. Virgil hesitated, that awful grin still plastered on his face. I gestured with the barrel of the gun, and he finally turned to follow his companion, his long strides quickly eating up the distance. They kept walking, their figures shrinking against the vastness of the night. For a moment, the relief was overwhelming. I had done it. I had faced them down. They wouldn't get away with whatever foul deeds they had planned. But the relief turned to ice as I watched their retreating forms. Something shifted in the way Virgil moved, an unfurling of that gangly frame. Clem's shoulders hunched further the backpack seeming to grow larger in the moonlight. Then they both stopped and spun in unison, facing me. 
my breath hitched. In the dim light, the shapes of their bodies seemed to distort, the shadows growing and twisting around them. Virgil's grin stretched inhumanly wide, revealing far too many teeth. Clem's backpack writhed as if something pulsed beneath the worn fabric. They started towards me, not walking now, but loping on all fours like monstrous, misshapen dogs. A scream tore its way out of my throat as I squeezed the trigger. The gun roared again and again, the flashes cutting through the darkness. I don't know if I hit them. In the chaos of noise and terror— Nothing registered except the feeling of being hunted. I turned and ran, fumbling with the keys, clawing my way back into the cab. I barely had the engine started before they were upon the truck, leaping against the side, their inhuman snarls echoing in the night. The impact shook the truck violently. I slammed it into gear and hit the accelerator, tires spitting gravel as the truck lunged forward. In the rearview mirror, I caught a glimpse of Virgil sprawled on the asphalt and Clem clinging to the side door, his claws scraping at the metal. I swerved, knocking him loose, and the truck surged forward, roaring into the night. I drove like a madman, headlights boring into the desolate darkness. Fear clawed at my throat. What in the hell were those things? My mind tried to rationalize, to explain. Animals, mutated by some toxic spill. Drug addicts gone feral. Anything but the impossible truth that seemed to lurk at the edge of my awareness. The gun lay on the seat beside me, useless now. I fumbled with the radio, but only got crackling static. No cell service out here, of course. It was just me the endless highway, and the things that hunted me. Miles turned into a blur. I don't remember how long I drove, only that eventually the sky started to lighten. As the first rays of dawn painted the horizon, I saw a sign looming ahead, a crossroads, and a dusty gas station huddled close by. Salvation or a trap? I didn't know, but I had to take the chance. I slammed on the brakes, swerving the truck into the cracked parking lot. As I lurched to a halt, I could see shapes moving out there in the dawn twilight, loping silhouettes against the brightening sky. I grabbed the gun and fumbled out of the truck, locking it behind me. The gas station was one of those relics of a bygone era, pumps rusted and peeling, the convenience store windows boarded up. But there was a phone booth a beacon of hope in this decaying wasteland. As I ran towards it, the figures emerged from the shadows. Virgil, his face contorted in a snarl, and Clem, clutching his wounded shoulder where blood soaked through his grimy overalls. They advanced, their movements jerky and predatory. I stumbled into the phone booth, slamming the glass door shut and punching in 911 with shaking fingers. The phone rang once, twice, three times, then nothing. Dead line. Panic threatened to swallow me whole. I looked around desperately. An axe was propped against the wall of the phone booth, probably for chopping firewood in the winter. I snatched it up, the heft of it feeling oddly comforting. Stepping back out of the booth, I hefted the axe and forced myself to stand my ground. They were closing in, the hunger in their eyes almost tangible. I knew there was no reasoning with them, no begging for mercy. If they got me, I wouldn't just die I'd become something like them. Terror gave way to a strange sort of clarity. I roared a defiant yell, a primal scream of a man pushed to the edge who was refusing to go down without a fight. Virgil lunged first his skeletal frame moving with shocking speed. I dodged his outstretched claws and swung the axe, feeling the blade sink deep into his shoulder. He let out an inhuman screech, but kept coming, blood spurting from the wound. Clem circled, looking for an opening. I swung wildly, 
forcing him back. But they were relentless. Virgil came at me again, his mouth gaping wide, the stench of his breath nearly making me gag. I swung the axe in a desperate arc, catching him across the face. The blade sliced through his cheek, taking a chunk of his jawbone. He staggered, and Clem seized the moment. He charged, his bulk slamming into me and knocking me to the ground. The axe flew from my grasp. I kicked and struggled, but Clem knelt on my chest, his breath foul in my face. His eyes glittered with mad triumph. He opened his mouth, his teeth sharp as knives. Then a thunderous roar ripped through the air. A gunshot. Clem jerked, a look of shocked disbelief on his face. He rolled off me, clutching at his chest. I scrambled back, a fresh surge of adrenaline propelling me. Another gunshot. Virgil crumpled to the ground, a smoking hole in his back. I whirled, searching for the source of the shots. A beat-up pickup truck was screeching into the parking lot, sunlight glinting off its dusty hood. A man leaned out the window, a rifle in his hands. He fired again and Virgil twitched once before falling still. The man jumped out of his truck, an older guy with a weathered face and a wary look in his eyes. He walked over, keeping the rifle trained on me until I raised my hands to show I was unarmed. Easy, he said, his voice gruff. You okay? I nodded, my voice barely a rasp. I still couldn't speak. The man surveyed the scene the bodies of Virgil and Clem, my wrecked semi. He lowered the rifle slightly. What the hell happened here? he asked. It took a long time to explain, and even longer for the police to arrive, for the long statement, the disbelief. They found no trace of drugs, no animal tracks, nothing to explain what I had seen that night. I never saw the man with the rifle again. Nobody believed my story, of course. They chalked it up to exhaustion, maybe a mental break brought on by too many nights on the road. I lost my license, and my career is over. In the hushed whispers of other truckers at roadside diners, I'd become a cautionary tale, the guy who went crazy out there in the desert. But I know what I saw. And sometimes, on those long sleepless nights, I hear them outside my window, that ragged breathing, those clicking, scratching sounds. I know they're still out there, somewhere in the vast emptiness of the American landscape. And I know, without a shadow of a doubt, that one day, they'll find me again. My name is Harlan Jacobs. I've been hauling cargo nationwide for longer than I care to remember. Makes a fella see some things out on the road. Mostly good, some bad, but nothing like this. Nothing that would make folks question your sanity if they heard the story. This all started around 03, up in Wyoming. Late August in Wyoming is a beautiful thing. Sky so blue it stretches on forever, those mountains in the distance, a touch of coolness in the air after the summer heat. It had been a good run so far, and I made it into Cheyenne feeling decent, in need of a real meal and a proper stretch of the legs. There's a truck stop a ways off the I-80, not the fanciest, but it usually has what I'm looking for. Pulling in, I noticed something was off. Hardly any trucks in the lot, and just a single car parked by the diner. City folk, probably, just passing through. I chalked it up to being the lull between meal rushes, and went inside. The first thing that hit me was the quiet. No chatter of truckers, no clank of dishes, just silence, broken by that low hum every old diner seems to have. The second thing was the smell. Not burnt food or anything rotten, but something 
sharp, metallic. Like iron and rain and something I couldn't place. The waitress, an older woman named Bev, if her name tag was right, didn't ask my order. Just gave me a long look and said, Coffee's fresh, before shuffling back behind the counter. Figured she'd had a long day. My coffee arrived moments later, steam curling up from the thick ceramic mug. It smelled fine, but when I took a sip, it tasted wrong. Bitter and a bit off, like it had gone cold and been reheated one time too many. I put the mug down and decided food wasn't worth the risk. Leaving a few bucks on the table, I went to use the restroom before hitting the road again. That's when I saw it. Blood. Spattered across the sink, the floor, even a few streaks high up on the grimy tile wall. Not a few drops, but like someone had opened a vein in there. Something prickled the back of my neck. I went back into the dining room, figuring on getting Bev to call and whatever had happened, but there was nobody there. No waitress, no car out front. It was like they'd vanished into thin air. I left the money for the untouched coffee by the door and practically ran for my truck. As I pulled back onto the highway, I spotted it in the rearview mirror. A figure, standing on the shoulder, just beyond the truck stop. Tall and possibly thin, dressed in tattered clothes as if he'd walked a hundred miles of hard road to get there. In the waning daylight, my eyes couldn't make out his features, but the way he stood, head tilted slightly, like a bird assessing its prey, that sent shivers down my spine. I put my foot down, leaving the truck stop and the strange figure behind. For the rest of that haul, I felt his gaze on me. Not the kind you can see, but that deep, instinctual feeling of being watched. I tried brushing it off as nerves, exhaustion, but the pit in my stomach wouldn't go away. Stopped for the night a couple hundred miles up the road, barely slept a wink. When I finished that run and swung back around through Wyoming again, I half expected to see the truck stop boarded up, yellow police tape strung across the entrance. But it was right there, like always, buzzing with truckers fueling up and grabbing a bite. On a whim, I pulled in. The diner looked cleaner somehow, brighter. There were folks eating, a new waitress behind the counter. The whole place had that low-level din you'd expect. I ordered a burger, mostly to see if anyone else reacted. Nobody did. Ate it just to make sure it tasted normal. It did. It all seemed fine, ordinary, like the previous experience had never happened. Yet, that sense of unease never fully left me. Months turned into years. Ran more Wyoming roots, never saw a hint of trouble. Started to think maybe I had dreamed the whole thing up, that bad coffee, the blood. But then, news reports started trickling in. Disappearances. Truckers, a lone hiker, even a couple on a road trip, the last known place was always some lonesome stretch of Wyoming Highway. No trace ever found, like they winked out of existence. They didn't make a big splash in the papers, but word like that travels fast in trucker circles. We all started choosing different routes, bypassing the state entirely whenever possible. That uneasy feeling settled back over me, heavier this time. I knew, somewhere in my gut, that the figure by the truck stop, those disappearances, they were connected. But connecting it how? To what? It gnawed at me for months, the not knowing. Then, last fall, I was hauling a load through Nebraska. Stopped at a hole-in-the-wall diner in the middle of nowhere. Just as I was sitting down, I caught movement out of the corner of my eye. He was there, standing outside the window. Same hunched, ragged a figure, but this time the daylight laid his features bare. Sallow skin stretched tight over bone, eyes sunk so deep in his skull they looked like empty holes, and a smile, 
That damned smile, thin and sharp, like a predator showing its teeth. I froze. For a heartbeat, time seemed to stutter. Then, he tilted his head ever so slightly and turned away, disappearing around the side of the building. My blood ran cold. He was here. That meant... Fumbling in my pocket, I slammed down a handful of bills on the table and stumbled out of the diner. My truck was still parked out front where I'd left it. He could be anywhere. I scanned the parking lot, the scrubby expanse of planes stretching out to the horizon, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. There. A flash of movement by the dumpster out back. I broke into a run, the gravel crunching beneath my boots. Rounding the corner, I saw him. He was crouching, back turned to me, and he was... eating. My stomach turned. It wasn't an animal carcass, but something long and pale, a human shape. Bile rose in my throat, and I clapped a hand over my mouth, stifling a gag. He must have heard me, because he straightened, his movements twitchy and uneven. There was blood smeared around his mouth, dripping in crimson rivulets down his chin. And his eyes. God, those eyes, when he turned to look at me, they were filled with a dark, hungry glee that made my skin crawl. I don't know how long I stood there, paralyzed with terror. Then instinct kicked in. I whirled and ran. He let out an ear-piercing screech that echoed across the empty landscape. I heard him behind me, his footsteps crunching on the gravel. He was closing in. I reached my truck, fumbling with the keys, my fingers shaking uncontrollably. Just as I yanked the door open, he lunged for me. I ducked inside, slammed the door shut, and threw it into gear. Tires spitting gravel, I peeled out of the parking lot and back onto the highway. In the rearview mirror, I saw him standing in the middle of the road, his spindly frame silhouetted against the setting sun. He didn't move as I sped away, he just watched. And I knew, deep down, it wasn't over. I drove through the night, never stopping, not once. My brain raced, a frantic jumble of fear and desperate plans. I couldn't go to the cops. Who would believe me? Even if they did, how do you catch a creature like that? I needed proof, evidence, something. But first, I needed to get away. I kept driving, fueled by a cocktail of coffee, truck stop snacks, and pure, bone-deep terror. Days turned into a sleepless blur. I crossed state lines, changed my route on a whim, took back roads to avoid major highways. But all the while, I could feel his presence out there, a shadow hanging over me. The knowledge that he was always just a few steps behind. Then, on a deserted stretch of road cutting through New Mexico, I saw my chance. A billboard loomed in the distance, advertising a roadside attraction, the world's largest petrified man. I pulled over, my mind already racing. It was risky, stupid maybe, but it might be my only option. The attraction was a relic, one of those tourist traps that flourished decades ago but now clung to life on the fumes of nostalgia. It was deserted, just a dusty parking lot fronted by a ticket booth and a towering fiberglass statue of a cowboy. I grabbed my tire iron from under the seat and went to work. I smashed the headlights of my truck, gouged long scratches down the side panels, ripped the side mirrors off. It hurt to vandalize my rig like that, my livelihood on wheels. But I had to make it believable. When I was done, it looked like I'd been run off the road, attacked. Then I took out my phone. I'd never been so glad to get terrible cell service. Dialing 911, my fingers shook so hard I nearly dropped the phone. I gasped out my location, gave a panicked description of an ambush. Assailants unknown, 
and begged for help. My voice was barely above a whisper, cracked with fear. They promised to send a unit, but out here that could mean hours. Now the waiting game. I sat in my wrecked truck, sweating despite the chill of the desert night, and watched the road. It seemed to take an eternity, but finally, headlights appeared in the distance. A state trooper's car pulled up, and an officer stepped out, flashlight cutting a swath through the darkness. I stumbled out of my truck, playing the part of the terrified survivor. My story poured out in hiccuping half-truths, forced off the road, attackers wearing masks. I fought back, managed to escape. I didn't mention the creature that would ensure a trip to the psych ward. The officer surveyed the damage, looked shaken. He called it in, promised reinforcements, told me to wait there, stay safe. Then he left. Hours passed. Nobody came. No other troopers, no ambulance, just the silence of the desert stretching out under the vast expanse of the starry sky. The exhaustion was seeping into my bones, but I didn't dare close my eyes. I had to stay on guard, stay ready. Just before dawn, the headlights reappeared. Several cars this time. I could make out the shapes of a tow truck, an ambulance, salvation, maybe. Then my gut clenched. In the lead car, I could see him. The creature from the truck stop, from the diner, silhouetted in the passenger seat. A dark, twisted grin stretched across his face. He'd used the cop to find me. I bolted. Blindly, I ran for the petrified cowboy statue, the fiberglass monstrosity my only hope of hiding. I scrambled over the low fence and dove behind it, heart pounding in my ears. Footsteps crunched on gravel, closer and closer. They were searching. He was out there. Then, the ambulance engine roared to life. I peered cautiously around the statue's leg. They were driving away, taillights glowing red in the pre-dawn darkness. Relief washed over me, then a fresh surge of determination. They thought they had me trapped, helpless. They were wrong. The moment they disappeared from sight... I emerged from my hiding spot. They'd taken the road, heading back towards civilization. My only hope lay in the opposite direction, deeper into the wilderness. I struck out across the desert, the petrified cowboy fading into the distance behind me. The sun rose, casting a harsh, unforgiving light on the arid landscape. I had no water, no food, just the adrenaline coursing through my veins, and the grim determination to survive. I stumbled on, the rough ground tearing at my boots, my clothes snagging on thorny brush. My throat burned with thirst, my vision wavered at the edges. But I pushed on, driven by the image of those hollow eyes, that predatory grin. Days blurred together. I moved from shadow to shadow during the blistering heat, staggered on by starlight when the desert chill set in. I scavenged what I could, a puddle of brackish water in a dry creek bed, a handful of shriveled berries that tasted more of sand than fruit. I started seeing things, mirages shimmering on the horizon, distorted shapes flickering at the edge of my perception. Hunger gnawed at my insides, and the sun scorched my skin raw. I don't know how much longer I could have lasted. Then, a miracle. A plume of smoke snaking up into the clear blue sky. Someone was out here. A ranch. A hermit's cabin. Someone who could help. With renewed strength, I staggered toward the smoke, each ragged breath a promise. As I drew closer, a ramshackle dwelling materialized out of the haze. A rusted-out trailer a corral, horses kicking up dust in the pen. There was a pickup truck parked out front, a faded red with a cracked windshield. Salvation. I stumbled towards the trailer, 
my voice a hoarse croak by the time I reached the door. Help! I gasped, knocking feebly. The door swung open, and a wave of nausea washed over me. I recognized the face framed in the doorway. It was him. The creature. Only, now he wasn't a ragged scarecrow. Here, he was someone else. He wore work jeans, a checkered shirt, his hair neatly combed, that hideous grin replaced with a friendly smile. Well now, you look a mite lost, friend, he drawled, his voice smooth and deceptively normal. Come on in, get yourself out of the sun. Despair settled over me like a shroud. I should have known. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. They were everywhere. I stumbled inside. It smelled of cooked meat, not the rotting stench I'd associated with him, but something hot, greasy, almost inviting. He shut the door behind me and gestured to a worn kitchen table. Sit down. I was just fixing some breakfast. On the table sat a plate piled high with eggs, bacon, and something else. Long strips of meat, glistening with fat, charred at the edges. A pile of gnawed bones lay beside the plate. My stomach twisted. He saw the look on my face, and his grin widened. Nothing like fresh game in the morning. He chuckled, sliding into the seat across from me. He picked up a strip of meat and took a bite, tearing the flesh with sharp, uneven teeth. You're a hunter, I choked out, my voice barely above a whisper. Best kind of hunter, he said with a wink. Plenty of strays out here, nobody to miss them. That's when I fully understood. Outcasts, loners, people on the fringes of society, easy targets. He lured them here, fattened them up, then feasted. And the cops, the troopers, they were in on it too, delivering victims right to his waiting table. You won't get away with it, I said, but even to my own ears it sounded weak. Get away with what? he asked, tilting his head. Nobody's gonna come looking for you, old-timer. Nobody cares about a washed-up trucker who disappears on the long haul. No wife, no kids, he shrugged. Just another statistic. A sob tore itself from my throat. I wasn't afraid of dying anymore. What terrified me was what came after, oblivion, swallowed into the darkness, erased from the world without leaving a trace. A dark resolve hardened within me. He might break my body, take my life, but they wouldn't take my voice. Someone will find this place. I forced out, staring him dead in the eye. People will know. That's when the first bullet ripped through the trailer wall, throwing up splinters of wood. He let out a startled yell as a second shot shattered the window above the sink. I scrambled for cover as more gunfire erupted. You got company! A voice boomed from outside. Backup had arrived. Not who I expected, but here nonetheless. Hunters, perhaps, drawn by the gunshots. I crawled behind the upturned table just as the trailer door burst open, followed by a volley of gunfire. The trailer erupted into chaos. Screams, more gunshots, the thudding of bodies hitting the floor. I stayed huddled in my shelter, not daring to raise my head. Then silence. I waited, barely breathing, listening for any sign of movement. A pair of battered cowboy boots appeared in my field of vision. A man stood over me, rifle slung over one shoulder. He had the weathered face of someone who spent their life outdoors, and there was a grim look in his eyes as he took in the carnage. You okay? he grunted. I nodded dumbly, unable to speak. He surveyed the scene, the bodies sprawled on the floor. One of them lay closest a pool of blood spreading from beneath his unnaturally thin frame. Damn, the man muttered. Heard whispers about something like this, 
preying on travelers. Never thought it was real. He squatted down and touched the creature's waxy skin, the open, staring eyes. What the hell is it? Doesn't matter, I said, finally finding my voice. It's over. I told my story to the hunter and the cops who eventually showed up. They found more bodies hidden around the property, skeletal remains, evidence of a killing spree that had gone on for far too long. My truck, with its smashed headlights and false damage, cemented my story about the ambush. Headlines flared about a monstrous cannibal clan brought down, a remote desert hideaway exposed. The aftermath was long, complicated, messy, but I survived. My name is Tom, and this happened to me in 2010 on the I-40 freeway, between Amarillo, Texas, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was an ordinary day, just another run on the old 40, sun in my face, tunes on the radio. I've driven back and forth so many times I've lost count. Sometimes I think the road knows me better than I know myself. Nothing too eventful ever happened before, but this time, well, this time was different. Out in the distance, I saw it, a hitchhiker, standing beside a battered-looking truck. Now, I usually don't pick up hitchhikers. Not out of meanness, but because most long-haul drivers get told not to. Something about liability, insurance, yada yada. But this time... Something felt off. My gut churned, a sort of prickling on the back of my neck. Despite that, I pulled over. The hitchhiker didn't even wave, just walked toward the cab as I hit the unlock button on the door. Up close, he was a sight. Tall, lanky, not a looker, that's for sure. His face was deeply tanned, like weathered leather. His eyes... They were the unsettling part. Not the color, a kind of faded blue, but the way they stared, empty, almost vacant. The guy was thin, I mean stick figure thin, his jeans hung loose about his legs. His shirt, once white probably, looked more like a dish rag now. He climbed into the cab, not a hello, not a thanks, just settled in like he was expecting the ride all along. Something was off with this guy, but I couldn't put my finger on it. We hit the road again. The prickle in my neck did an ease. I tried to make conversation. Long way you're headed, huh? Where you going? He just stared out the window. Not a flinch, not a blink, just staring at the highway rushing past. Tough break about your truck there, man. What went wrong? Silence. Nothing but the hum of the engine. By now, I was starting to get creeped out. I figured this guy must be tired, lost his ride, maybe had a rough day. Who knows? Folks end up on the side of the road for all sorts of reasons. Best to let him be, I reckoned. We drove like that for a couple of hours. The sun started going down throwing long shadows across the desert. I flipped on my headlights. That's when it happened. Up ahead, a flicker of movement in the dimming light. My blood ran cold. Deer. Not just one, but a small herd, crossing the highway right in front of us. I slammed on the brakes, the truck swerved. I fought the wheel, trying to avoid hitting them trying to keep us on the road. In the cab, it was chaos, the radio blaring, my stuff from the dashboard scattered on the floor. From the corner of my eye, I saw the passenger. He hadn't even moved. I righted the truck. We'd gone into the shoulder, kicking up gravel and dirt. I pulled to a stop, breathless, shaking. We were lucky, the deer had scattered, and it hadn't been as bad as it could have been. 
Shaking my head, I turned to the passenger. Listen, man, I don't know what your deal is, but you gotta get out. Now. You're spooking me. He just kept staring out the window. I repeated myself, louder this time. Still, nothing. That's it, I thought. Something in me snapped. I reached over, grabbed his arm, ready to physically pull him out. He turned his head toward me. His eyes were different. Black. Not like a pupil, but the entire eye, like an empty well. A jolt went through me, a mix of fear and revulsion. I yanked my hand away. He opened his mouth. Not to speak, but in a wide, unnatural grin, exposing rows of sharp teeth. They weren't human teeth. I fumbled for the door handle, flung it open, and ran. Not a glance back, just ran. The sound of the truck door slamming echoed behind me. I don't know how long I ran or how far. My lungs burned, my heart hammered. Finally, I collapsed against a cold, rocky outcropping, gasping for breath. When I dared to look back, the road was empty. No sign of my truck, no sign of the hitchhiker. My phone slipped from my fumbling fingers as I scrambled to call for help. 911, what's your emergency? The words poured out of me, a panicked jumble of half-truths and the lingering terror clinging to my soul. I tried to explain, tried to sound sane. I saw the dispatcher's doubt in her voice, and the questions focused on my state of mind, rather than the impossible creature I had encountered. The police arrived. They found my truck where I said it would be, but there was no trace of the hitchhiker. The officers questioned me again, gentle, almost condescending. Was I stressed? Exhausted? Sure, I was, but I hadn't imagined what I saw. They even checked me for drugs. It was humiliating. In the end, they patted my shoulder, told me to drive safer, calmer. And that was it. But it wasn't over. The incident gnawed at me. It wasn't just the terror, but something else, a nagging doubt. It had all happened so fast, my senses overwhelmed. Was my mind playing tricks? Was there a simpler explanation? The following weeks were hazy. Sleep didn't come easy. My wife, bless her heart, thought I'd cracked under the strain of the road. My boss suggested taking time off, but a trucker without work doesn't eat. So I forced myself back into the driver's seat, back onto the I-40. I tried to push the memory aside, chalk it up to a bad trip. But nights on the road, the solitude, the endless miles, they all dragged back those chilling images. Every shadow in the twilight seemed like a monstrous form. Every flicker of movement made my pulse quicken. I started to question everything, the glint of headlights in my mirrors, the rumble of a passing truck. One night, that same stretch of highway, a storm was brewing. Gusts of wind rattled the cab, rain lashed the windshield. Through the blur, I saw another trucker pulled onto the side of the road. For a split second, I thought about stopping, offering help. But fear not at me, a whisper of a memory. I kept driving. The next day, the news hit. That driver, a man named Paul Jenkins, middle-aged, two kids at home, he was missing. His rig abandoned, not a mark against him. The guilt weighed on me like lead. Had I seen something? Did that hitchhiker have anything to do with it? I didn't know, but that was it. No more runs for me. I couldn't risk it. I couldn't keep driving, wondering how many more like Paul might disappear just because I looked away. It didn't fix things. It didn't take back what I saw, or erase the guilt that clung to me like a second skin. The cops, bless them, they tried. Investigated the disappearance, chased loose ends. 
nothing. Paul Jenkins became just another mystery swallowed by the asphalt. My wife, Sarah, never truly understood. Couldn't comprehend the burden I carried. Thought time would heal it. But it didn't. The distance grew between us, with every sleepless night, every flinch at a shadow. Eventually it broke us. I couldn't go back, not to my old life, not to the man I was before. Some nights, a part of me still wonders, was it simply exhaustion, a trick of the mind in the desert twilight? Or was there something out there, some darkness I caught a glimpse of? A creature masquerading as a hitchhiker, preying on the lonely souls of the highway? I found a job pumping gas at a roadside station. Small, mind-numbing work, but honest. The road, I watch it from a distance now. Each car passing, I think of the people inside, their journeys, their lives. And sometimes, I think of Paul Jenkins, of his family, and the thing that stole him away into the vast, unforgiving landscape. The hitchhiker, he never resurfaced. Maybe never existed at all, except in the dark corners of my own mind. But the I-40, that winding ribbon of asphalt, it's different now. It has secrets, whispers of vanishings the world never sees. And I, I know my place in it, not the trucker on a familiar route, but the watcher at the gas pump, ever vigilant, bearing witness to the untold stories that the road whispers and wondering when the shadows might shift again. My name's Dave, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2008. Wasn't my greatest year the divorce had just finalized, and the recession was starting to bite hard. Figured all I had left was the road, so I was clinging on to my runs for dear life. Been driving this route for years, back and forth along the I-90 through Wyoming. It ain't glamorous, hauling cattle feed and fertilizer, but it's a paycheck. That night, I was rolling east, empty trailer bouncing behind me, headed back towards Sheridan. The stars were out like diamonds, and it was so quiet I figured everyone in the whole state had already called it a night. Had the radio tuned to some classic rock station out of Montana, just to keep myself awake. Must have been around midnight when I spotted it up ahead, a flicker of light off the side of the road. Now, I'm not one for stopping, not without a good cause. Trucker rule number one is to keep on schedule and messing around with broken-down cars ain't my job. But as I got closer, something seemed off. It wasn't headlights, more like a campfire, flickering and throwing long shadows against the scrub brush. Curiosity got the better of me, and besides, a little human contact might break up the monotony of the night. I pulled the rig onto the dirt shoulder. The flicker resolved itself into a small blaze and a figure hunched beside it. I climbed down from the cab, the blast of cold air hitting me hard after the warmth inside. Something prickled along my neck. The figure didn't move as I approached, didn't even turn their head. Hey there, I called out, keeping my distance. Everything all right? Need some help? Silence. The fire guttered, throwing sparks into the night. The figure still hadn't moved. Unease settled over me. I took a step closer. The figure was dressed in an old, faded flannel jacket and jeans. From the back, it could have been anyone a guy down on his luck, a stranded motorist. Then the figure moved. Not a big movement, just a shift the head dipping forward slightly. That's when I saw it. The moonlight fell on the exposed skin of his neck, and it wasn't skin at all. It glistened, wet and mottled, like raw meat. The guy had scales. I reeled back, 
a jolt of adrenaline hitting me. He raised his head and turned. He wasn't human. Not even close. His face was wrong, somehow. Eyes bulging and frog-like, set wide apart on a flat, snout head. The mouth stretched in a grotesque grin, full of needle-sharp teeth. The whole shape of it was off, like a bad costume trying to imitate a real person. He sniffed the air, his nostrils flaring wide. Terror kicked in. I turned and ran. Back to the truck, fumbled for the keys, my fingers clumsy with the rising panic. The creature didn't make a sound, but I knew, I knew it was coming after me. I scrambled into the cab, slammed the door shut, and started the engine. Tires screeched on gravel as I reversed, then hauled the rig around in a wide turn, my headlights sweeping across the darkness. He was there, loping towards me on two spindly legs. They were inhumanly long, and he moved with an odd, jerky gait. I mashed the gas pedal, the truck lurched forward. He kept coming, closing the distance with impossible speed. My heart jackhammered in my chest he would reach the truck any second, those claws tearing through the metal door like it was tinfoil. Then he veered off, disappearing into the brush. I hit the brakes, confused. Why wasn't he chasing me anymore? I sat there, shaking, staring out at the moonlit expanse, expecting him to emerge again at any moment. Time passed, stretched thin with tension. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I slammed the rig into gear and hauled us out of there, never looking back. The rest of that night was a blur. I drove non-stop until dawn, the image of that scaled neck and those toothy jaws seared into my brain. I stopped in Gillette just long enough to gas up, my hands shaking so badly I could barely hold the pump steady. I figured I had to report it. Sounded crazy, I knew, but I couldn't ignore what I'd seen. The cops in Gillette were not impressed. The tired officer who took my statement looked me up and down like I was some strung-out meth head. He questioned me relentlessly, poking holes in my story, insinuating I was making it up as an excuse for being late with my delivery. I got angry then. Started shouting, demanding they search that stretch of highway, saying there was something dangerous out there. They hauled me down to the station— probably figured I'd calm down with a few hours in a cell. That's when I made the mistake of telling them I needed to speak to a fish and wildlife officer, something about the scales. That landed me square in the psych ward of the county hospital. They kept me under observation for two days, a doctor poking and prodding at my mind, asking me about hallucinations, about my history of mental instability. They treated me like I was delusional, like I wasn't the sane one in the room. When they finally released me, there was a mark on my record. Not an official diagnosis, but enough to cast suspicion. Trucker's talk, word traveled fast. Within a month, I'd lost my long-haul job. The good companies wouldn't touch me, said I was a liability. Ended up working local routes around Sheridan hauling manure and gravel. The pay was crap, and my pride took a beating. Sarah couldn't handle it. She'd seen my struggles with stress before, but this time was different. She saw it in my eyes, that haunted look I couldn't shake. She started making noises about me needing professional help, about taking meds to stabilize my moods. I blew up at her then told her I wasn't crazy, that what I saw was real. It was the last straw. She moved out a few days later, taking the kids. I was alone. The loneliness was the worst part. It ate away at me from the inside, whispering doubts, twisting my memories until I started questioning myself. Maybe the doctors were right. Maybe it had been a trick of the light some shadow casting a bizarre shape against the fire. 
I tried to convince myself it was a bad dream, tried to forget. But you don't just forget things like that. It simmered beneath the surface, an unshakable fear that followed me on every route. I couldn't look at a patch of roadside without picturing that thing, hunkered down, waiting. My sleep was fitful, full of nightmares where I was the one running, the one hunted. Then came the news reports. Started a few months after that night on the I-90. Hikers disappearing in the Bighorn Mountains, campers vanishing without a trace. No bodies, no evidence, just people gone, like they'd stepped into thin air. The cops blamed mountain lions, maybe a grizzly gone rogue. People around here used to wild animals, but this felt different. The disappearances were too clean, too calculated. The stories hit close to home. Some of those missing folks, I'd seen them around, truck stops, diners. Ordinary people, just like me. I kept thinking about a young family I saw once in Buffalo, a dad, a mom, and their little girl with bright pink shoes. Three weeks later, they were all over the news, faces staring out from missing person flyers. It was then I knew. Knew I'd seen the culprit that night. It wasn't an animal, not exactly. It was something else, something monstrous parading around in a crude imitation of a human. It was out there, lurking in the shadows, preying on the unsuspecting, and I was the only one who knew its secret. I tried telling myself I should forget it, move on. But how could I, knowing that for every day I did nothing, more people might vanish? My conscience gnawed at me, relentless. Besides, forgetting wasn't possible anymore. I was already a different man, changed by what I'd witnessed. A man with nothing to lose, and a desperate need to settle the score. Right now, I'm packing supplies. I've got my dad's old hunting rifle, and more ammo than I'll probably ever need. My route tonight takes me right past that same stretch of the I-90, and this time, I'll be ready. It probably won't come for me, not at first. But if I make enough noise, start enough of a ruckus, well, that creature, it's curious, I remember that. And it's hungry. I'm not a hero. Not even close. I'm just an ordinary guy pushed to the edge, driven by fear, guilt, and a sliver of stubborn hope. Hope that, tonight, maybe I'll get lucky. Maybe I'll get a clean shot, and put an end to the nightmare stalking those lonely highways. My name is Ray. This happened to me in 2016, on a run along the I-75 near the Georgia-Florida border. I've been driving trucks for close to 25 years, so I ain't what you call easily rattled. Seen my share of bad accidents and close calls. But this, this was on a whole other level. Funny thing is, the night started normal. I'd picked up a load of building materials in Valdosta, heading to Fort Lauderdale. Weather was mild, not a cloud in the sky. The radio played some old country song I couldn't remember the name of, but I hummed along. Figured it'd just be another night in this lonely metal box rolling down the highway. It was just past midnight when I spotted the car. An old sedan pulled up on the side of the road. Hazard lights were on, and steam billowed out from under the hood. It looked like a classic case of engine trouble. I've got a soft spot for folks in a jam, so I flipped my signal and eased the rig over to the shoulder. The sedan's driver was a young guy, thin, almost scrawny, with wild, unkempt hair. Had a panicked look in his eye as I climbed down from the cab. He started rambling. Something about driving cross-country from California. How the engine gave out in the middle of nowhere. Can I use your phone, man? 
My cell died hours back and there ain't a reception out here. I handed him my phone. He fumbled with it for a second, then cursed under his breath. No signal out here, he muttered. A chill went down my spine. I always had full bars on this stretch. I looked down at my phone. Yeah, there it was. No signal. Look, I got a deadline to meet. Can I get you a tow into town or something? Nah, man, friends on the way. Just needed to make a call, is all. He handed the phone back to me with a tight, almost forced smile. Something was off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Guy seemed harmless enough, just freaked out. I shrugged it off. Well, stay safe out here. Don't wander off. I climbed back into the cab and prepared to hit the road. As a final precaution, I glanced into the side-view mirror. The guy hadn't moved. He was staring straight at the truck, eyes fixed on me. My stomach tightened as an old warning bell clanged in my head. If something feels wrong, get the hell out of there. I threw the truck into gear and peeled out. In my rearview mirror, I saw movement. The sedan was whipping around in a U-turn, kicking up dust and gravel, heading toward me. My heart leaped into my throat. The guy was no longer waving for help. He was gunning for me. Adrenaline surged through my body. The sedan sped up fast. I was in a massive eighteen-wheeler, but on this open road, it felt like a clumsy beast next to that low-slung car. I floored the accelerator. The sedan crept up on me, closer and closer. Then I saw it. A flash of metal in the dim light. The guy was leaning out of his window, something clutched in his hand. A gun. He fired, and the sound was deafening echoing against the truck's metal. My back window shattered, spraying glass across my seat. Fear kicked instinct into gear. I swerved, a sharp turn sending the truck lumbering across the lanes. He fired again, and I heard a loud thunk as the bullet hit the side of the rig. Up ahead, I saw a sign for an exit ramp. It was my only chance. I yanked the wheel sending the truck careening off the highway. The sedan followed close behind. I barreled down the ramp, the rough pavement jarring my teeth. The sedan kept pace, like a shadow I couldn't shake. The exit opened onto a desolate county road, flanked by dark woods on either side. The car's headlights flickered ominously behind me. I pushed the truck as fast as it would go my knuckles turning white on the steering wheel. My only thought was escape. Find help, civilization, anything but this lonely road. Up ahead, a flicker of light. A gas station, an old rundown place, but salvation nonetheless. I swerved into the gravel lot, tires screeching. The sedan screeched to a stop behind me. I fumbled for the release as the guy jumped out of his car. I slammed the door open, bolted for the gas station. I could hear his boots pounding on the gravel behind me. Bursting through the door, I yelled, Help! Someone call 911! The place was empty. No cashier, no customers, just a dusty counter and a flickering fluorescent light overhead. Panic gnawed at my guts. I ran for the back exit. It flew open, and I tumbled out into the darkness. He was waiting for me. I scrambled to my feet. He stood there, gun outstretched, his form illuminated by the dim glow from the gas station lights. His smile was the stuff of nightmares wide, inhuman, stretching his lips over teeth that looked too sharp. My mind raced. There was nowhere to go. Behind me, the gas station. But out here, just open fields stretching into the inky night. He raised the gun, aiming it with steady hands. In that split second, something clicked. Not fear, 
but a sort of desperate defiance. This wasn't just some car trouble or road rage. This was a hunter, and I was his prey. I wasn't going down without a fight. I lunged at him, not a plan, just blind instinct. He fired, but I was moving too fast. The bullet was past my ear. I barreled into him, knocking the gun from his hand. We stumbled, rolling through the dirt. I ended up on top, but he was stronger. He threw me off, clawed at my face. I kicked out, a desperate strike that connected with his knee. He let out a roar, more animal than human. For a moment, he was vulnerable. I scrambled to my feet, searching for the gun. My hands landed on it, the cold metal chilling my skin. I turned, leveling the weapon at him. He was rising, wild fury in his eyes. I fired. Once, twice. The gunshots echoed through the night, deafening in the sudden stillness. He collapsed. Blood soaked the dirt around him. My hands were shaking, the gun nearly slipping from my grasp. I stumbled back, staring at what I'd done. When the cops arrived, it was a mess. Two bodies, a frantic trucker with a wild story. The kid was a missing person, name of Kyler something, vanished weeks before. They found more in his car, zip ties, rope, a bloody knife. My story sounded insane, muttering about toothy grins and scales in the moonlight. The cops were sympathetic, at first. Then suspicion crept in. They tested me for drugs, grilled me about my past. I was a suspect. Not the victim, but a potential murderer. Took three days for the test results to come back negative, for them to grudgingly accept that I acted in self-defense. I was cleared in the end, legally speaking. But the shadow never left. The local news ran the story, splashed photos of my face and the kid's mangled car across the screen. My career was toast. No trucking company would touch me after that, the stigma too heavy. Sarah couldn't take it. Said she couldn't be with a man haunted by, well, haunted by whatever she thought I'd seen out there. She took the kids, left me with an empty house and a pocket full of nightmares. I found work at a gas station, not the one where it happened, but a similar, lonely outpost on some forgotten highway. Nights are the worst. I mend the register, watching every car that pulls up, eyes darting to the shadows, always waiting for that inhuman form to emerge once more. Some nights I try to tell myself it was the stress, the exhaustion of the road playing tricks. Other nights, I check the security camera footage, scrutinizing the faces of customers, looking for a flash of those two sharp teeth. The fear is always there, lurking in my gut. I never learned what he was, that kid with the gun and the hungry eyes. Monster, man, man, something else entirely, it doesn't matter. He changed me, he took everything I cared about, my job, my family my sense of peace. And even if I'm never attacked again, the damage is done. I survived, but at a terrible cost. Sometimes, on those long, sleepless nights, I wonder if maybe it'd have been easier if I hadn't. Easier to be a name on a missing person poster than to live like this, the hunted who got away, forever waiting for the hunter to find him again. My name's Marcus, and this happened to me back in 2009. I'd been long-haul trucking for eight years by then, seen plenty of strange stuff on these roads, but nothing, absolutely nothing, prepared me for that night. Used to be, I loved this job. Something about the solitude, the wide-open highways, just me and my rig. Lately, though, 
I couldn't shake the feeling something was watching me. Might sound crazy, but the loneliness, it started to feel heavy, oppressive. Like I wasn't alone out there after all. The night it happened, I had a run taking me out west through Oklahoma. Flat country, not much to see. It was after sundown, no traffic to speak of, just me and the hum of the engine. Up ahead, I spotted a hitchhiker standing beside the road. In my younger days, I might have pulled over, but company rules were strict about that, and besides, something about the guy sent a shiver down my spine. He wasn't much to look at, short, scrawny, kind of hunched over. Face obscured by an old ball cap pulled low. But it was those hands, pale, bony, almost skeletal, clutched tight to a battered backpack. I kept on driving. In the rearview mirror, I saw him raise one of those skeletal hands, a sort of half-wave. Unease prickled at the base of my neck. About a mile down the road, guilt kicked in. What if the guy really was in trouble, out there all alone? Finally, I cursed under my breath and turned the rig around. It was stupid, I knew, but I couldn't just leave him there. I pulled back up beside him. He approached the cab slowly, stiffly. Up close, I could see deep lines etched into his face, dirt ground into the creases. He didn't look right. It wasn't his age, but the way his eyes seemed sunken, almost hollow. When he grinned, I got a glimpse of his teeth yellowed and uneven, a few missing entirely. Appreciate it, he rasped, his voice raw, barely audible. He slid into the passenger seat, the old leather creaking under his weight. Name's Zeke, he muttered, extending a hand. I took it, reluctantly. His skin felt cold, clammy, like I was shaking hands with a fish. Marcus, I said. I offered him some water, but he just shook his head. Zeke sat silently, staring straight ahead at the road, his knuckles white where he clutched his backpack. We rode in silence for almost an hour. The whole time, that uneasy feeling grew stronger, like a bad smell you can't find the source of. Finally, he spoke. You drive this road often? His voice still had that same raspy quality. Fair amount, I replied trying to keep my tone casual. Ever see anything strange out here? I laughed, but it came out forced. Define strange. He turned to look at me. In the dim light, the hollows of his eyes seemed even deeper. Couple months ago, fella disappeared right off this highway. Vanished into thin air. Truck left abandoned by the side of the road. Not a trace of him anywhere. He paused, then added, Heard tell they found some bits of clothing. Ripped up. Like something with teeth got to him. My muscles tensed. I'd heard that story. Pastor truck stop gossip, dismissed as rumor. Now, I wasn't so sure. Cougars, maybe, I offered weakly. Zeke just smiled. Not a reassuring smile. It stretched his thin lips, revealing too many of those crooked teeth. We crossed the state line. I glanced over at Zeke, trying to gauge his reaction. Nothing. He just continued staring straight ahead, hands clenched in his lap. I started wondering where the hell he wanted to go. He hadn't set a destination. My unease morphed into a kind of tingling dread. I decided, screw this, I'd take him to the next town and dump him at a bus station. About ten miles out, I saw a sign for the town of Baxter. Seemed as good a place as any. Next town up, that's where I stop, I told Zeke, more firmly than I felt. Zeke nodded silently. The closer we got to Baxter the more agitated I became. Light shone ahead, the warm glow of civilization, but also a promise of ending this awkward journey, 
of sending Zeke on his way and being alone in my truck once more. I pulled the rig into a brightly lit truck stop on the outskirts of town. It was busy, a welcome sight after all that empty road. I turned to Zeke. This your stop. Zeke didn't move. Didn't even look at me. He just sat there, hands gripping that backpack, eyes locked on the truck stop. Something in his stillness sent a shiver down my spine. Hey, man. I said, my voice sharper this time. Time to get out. Slowly, he turned to look at me. In the harsh glare of the fluorescent lights, I saw the change. His face was still that same etched mask, but his eyes, they'd taken on a feral gleam, a hungry glint that chilled me to the bone. This ain't my stop, he rasped. His voice was still low, but it held a new, sharp edge. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. My survival instinct screamed at me. He wasn't just some weirdo hitchhiker, he was dangerous. I fumbled for the door handle, but he was faster. His skeletal hand lunged out, gripping my arm with surprising strength. His nails dug into my skin. We keep driving, he hissed, his breath foul and hot on my face. Panic surged through me. I wrenched my arm away, scrambling for the ignition key. Get the hell out of my truck! His thin lips peeled back in a snarl, exposing those yellow teeth. In the flickering light, they looked sharper, predatory. You brought me here, boy. Now we finish the ride. My mind raced. The doors were locked. If I could just start the rig back up, but he was already moving, lunging across the cab. He was shockingly quick for someone so scrawny. I kicked out, connecting with his chest, throwing him back. He let out a cry a screech that was more animal than human. I scrambled for the key, my fingers trembling. It slipped from my grasp, clattering under the seat. Zeke was on me again, his strength fueled by some dark, desperate need. We wrestled, the cab of the truck too small a space for this fight. He reeked of sweat and decay. Something snagged my jacket, a tear, and a wave of icy terror washed over me as I realized what it was, his nails, long, ragged claws ripping through the fabric. I lashed out, a lucky blow catching him across the jaw. He stumbled back, snarling. I dove for the floor, scrambling to find the ignition key. My fingers brushed against cold metal. Just as I closed my hand around it, his weight slammed into me knocking me sideways. The key flew free, disappearing into the darkness under the passenger seat. Zeke was on top of me, pinning me down. His eyes were wild, feral. He raised a clawed hand, ready to strike. Desperation fueled me. I bucked, throwing him off balance. He went sprawling, giving me a precious second. I scrambled to my feet, searching frantically for some kind of weapon. My gaze landed on the tire iron stowed behind the seat. I grabbed it, swinging wildly. He dodged the first blow, but the second caught him across the ribs with a sickening thud. He let out a howl, clutching his side. I seized my chance. Shoving past him, I lunged for the door, fumbled with the handle and threw myself out into the cool night air. I barely registered the sting of gravel against my knees as I scrambled to my feet and ran. Behind me, the truck's door slammed open. I risked a glance back. Zeke was emerging from the cab, his movement stiff. Rage contorted his features in the harsh light. He let out a roar that echoed across the truck stop. People were staring alerted by the commotion. But Zeke ignored them. His eyes were fixed on me, locked in with a single-minded determination. He started moving toward me, a limping, predatory stalk. I ran for my life. 
The shouts of curious onlookers faded behind me. My lungs burned, my muscles screamed, but I kept pushing. The image of Zeke's inhuman grin, his clawed hands, drove me onward. Ahead I saw salvation, a group of truckers gathered outside the diner. I burst into their circle, gasping for breath. Help! That guy, he's, he's crazy! Confused faces swiveled toward me. Then I heard it, the roar of Zeke's furious bellow. He appeared at the edge of the parking lot, silhouetted against the bright lights. The truckers turned to look, their expressions changing from confusion to alarm. He didn't hesitate. He charged toward us, his ragged form a blur in the night. The truckers acted on instinct, forming a rough semicircle in front of me. Zeke screeched to a halt a few feet away, his eyes flashing with rage. One of the truckers, a burly guy named Hank, stepped forward. What the hell's your problem, pal? Zeke didn't answer. He just crouched low, muscles tensed, like a cornered animal about to attack. Something glinted in the light, his teeth, no longer teeth, fangs. A wave of unease rippled through the group of truckers. I could see it in their faces, the flicker of recognition, that something was deeply wrong here. Hank raised the crowbar he always carried as a makeshift weapon. Zeke snarled in response, the sound chillingly inhuman. The fight was chaotic, a flurry of fists and curses. Zeke moved with a speed that defied his wiry frame, darting in and out, striking with those clawed hands. One of the truckers, a younger guy named Danny, fell with a scream, clutching his bloodied arm. Zeke capitalized on the moment, lunging toward me. I stumbled back, tripped, and fell hard to the gravel. He was on me in an instant, pinning me down. I looked up into those mad eyes, felt his foul breath on my face, saw the yellowed fangs descending towards my throat. Then, a gunshot rang out. Seat shrieked, jerking back. Blood bloomed on his ragged shirt. He staggered away, clutching at his chest. Hank stood there, crowbar discarded, smoke curling from the barrel of a revolver. Zeke stumbled backwards, a choked gurgle escaping his lips. He collapsed to the ground, twitching. The truckers warily approached, weapons raised. I stayed where I was, legs trembling, barely able to breathe. When the cops arrived, it was pandemonium. Trying to explain to those small-town officers about Zeke, about the teeth, those ragged claws. It was like something out of a nightmare. They took me in for questioning, suspicion heavy in their eyes. It took hours, the same questions over and over. Self-defense was obvious, they said, but my story. They tested me for drugs, anything that could explain the wild hallucinations. The tests came back clean. Finally, they let me go, a warning muttered about not going around picking up hitchhikers. I staggered out of that police station into the gray dawn, feeling broken and utterly alone. My truck was impounded as evidence. Even though they cleared me, there would be an investigation, a hearing. My career was in tatters. Word spreads fast in the trucking community. I didn't even try to get another long-haul job. No one would hire a guy with a story like mine. Landed a gig driving a delivery van for a grocery store. The pay is lousy, and the guys I work with, they look at me with a mix of pity and suspicion. Like everyone's waiting for me to finally snap, go all psycho killer. Sarah left a few months after it happened. Said she couldn't live with the fear anymore. With the way I flinched at every shadow the nightmares I screamed myself awake from. I couldn't blame her. I tried therapy, but it didn't help. How do you explain to some shrink that you fought a monster on the side of the road? They smile those understanding smiles, pat you on the shoulder, 
maybe write you a prescription for some pills. The pills numb you, but they don't make the memories go away. Some nights are worse than others. Nights when the rain lashes at the window of my crummy apartment, and the wind sounds like a mournful howl. Those nights, I see Zeke's face, the glint of his fangs, the ragged claws reaching for me. He's out there, I know he is. Maybe not in the way people imagine, not some fanged ghoul or a werewolf. But the world is a lot bigger and darker than we think. There are shadows in the remote stretches of highway, the forgotten corners of truck stops, and those shadows harbor things sane folks can't comprehend. One day, he'll find me. It might not be tomorrow, or next year, but he will. I'm not the only trucker on the road, of course. There'll be others who disappear, their rigs found abandoned, Maybe a smear of blood and a few ripped shreds of clothing the only evidence. They'll go on the missing persons lists, become whispered tales around truck stop campfires. And I'll know. I'll know every time it happens. I'll know because I didn't just survive Zeke that night. I escaped. And sooner or later, predators always return to the site of unfinished kills. It's only a matter of time. My name is Harlan Matthews, and this happened to me back in September of 1994. I've been driving a semi for 20 years. I haul dry goods all across the lower 48, everything from groceries to plastic parts. It's a life that gives you a mix of monotony and pure, heart-stopping terror. Nothing about my life is exciting. I exist on caffeine and truck stop food more often than not. Still, it's the only thing I've ever been good at, so I stick with it. The day this all started, I was on a multi-state run down the eastern seaboard. I picked up a load in Pennsylvania bound for rural South Carolina. It was an off-season shipment for some kind of agricultural equipment, big metal tiller things. Not my kind of load since there was no temperature control needed, but sometimes you gotta take what you can get. Night fell when I was still a good hundred miles out from my destination. Those winding country roads through the Carolinas are pitch black after dark, the pines closing in so thick even my high beams fought to pierce the gloom. To make matters worse, a steady rain had started falling. My wipers beat out a frantic rhythm and the whole truck was vibrating with the force of the wind. I saw the gas station up ahead as a beacon of light, the bright sign cutting through the downpour. I pulled in, grateful for an excuse to stretch my legs and drain my bladder. The place was desolate. Just a handful of old pumps, a rundown building with a flickering fluorescent sign proclaiming snacks and restrooms and a canopy overhead so cracked and rusted it looked about ready to cave in. The whole setup gave me the willies, but my tank and my coffee cup were both hitting empty. I got out and stretched, letting the rain wash over my face. For a sticky August night, the chill was cutting. I walked to the building and peered through the dirty windows. Inside, shelves stocked with dusty bags of chips and empty hooks lined the walls. A bored-looking attendant with hair the same color as motor oil flipped through a ratty girly magazine behind the counter. He barely looked up when I entered. Fill her up? I asked. He grunted, laying the magazine down. I paid and went through the familiar fueling routine, uncapping, shoving the nozzle in waiting for the slow glug of diesel. I took in the surroundings while the tank filled, the backwoods emptiness seeping into my bones. Even with the rumble of my truck running, the night was heavy with silence except for the endless hiss of rain. That's when I saw it. A flash of movement in the tree line behind the station, right at the edge of my headlights. Curious, 
and a little unnerved, I walked to the back of my rig for a better look. There was nothing but dense forest. I scanned the trees, expecting to see the gleam of a deer's eyes, but found nothing. Just your eyes playing tricks. I muttered to myself and was about to head back when I saw the movement again. This time, it was unmistakable, the dark silhouette of a man ducking between the trees. I froze, the hair on my neck standing up. Who the hell was out there? My headlights did little to illuminate the thick pine forest, but I strained my eyes. The figure hunched and moved strangely, its path uneven. It didn't seem to be heading my way, but that didn't make me feel any less uneasy. I thought about calling out, then decided against it. There was something off about the whole situation. I jogged back to the cab, a shiver that had nothing to do with the rain running down my spine. I climbed in, locked the doors, and started the engine. There was still a good long drive ahead of me, and suddenly I was desperate to be out of this creepy place. As my truck rumbled away, I glanced in the rearview mirror. The gas station shrank into a dot of light, then vanished as the road curved. Still, the unnerving feeling of being watched lingered. Miles later, the sense of unease had faded enough for me to relax slightly. The radio was crackling with static, so I switched on a cassette a buddy of mine had dubbed for me. Old Johnny Cash filled the cab, soothing my frayed nerves a little. I glanced at the clock. Almost midnight. If I'd pushed hard, I could reach my destination early and maybe snag a motel with a real bed instead of sleeping in the cab. The two-lane road cut through dense woods. Every so often, I'd flash by a ramshackle farmhouse or a gravel driveway disappearing into the trees, signs of life in the otherwise desolate landscape. The sense of isolation was intense, but with every mile ticked off, my anxiety lessened. Just a few more hours, and I'd be out of this rural emptiness. As I rounded a sharp bend, my headlights snagged something up ahead, a flicker of orange in the ditch. I slowed, straining my eyes. It looked like a road hazard sign, knocked over and partially obscured by bushes. Curious, I pulled off to the side of the road. My boots sank into the rain-softened earth as I approached the orange plastic. It wasn't a hazard sign, but a construction cone. And lying next to it, something that made my stomach lurch. A severed human hand lay mangled in the mud. Blood and dirt streaked bone, making the fingers curl in a grotesque claw. I stumbled back, my breath snagging in my throat. A wave of nausea and shock flooded me. Then I saw them, drag marks leading from the ditch and disappearing into the blackness of the woods. Someone, somehow, had lost a hand, then dragged themselves away to hide. Or something had dragged them. My mind raced. Had there been an accident? Was someone wounded out there, bleeding to death? I had to do something, but the thought of venturing into those dark woods, the same woods where I'd seen that shadow figure earlier that night, sent a primal fear coiling in my gut. I fumbled for my phone, but it was dead. Damn. I cursed myself for letting the battery go flat. I could try to drive until I found a signal, but what if whoever was injured was bleeding out right now? I fought back my terror. It went against every self-preservation instinct, but I knew I couldn't leave someone to die out there. Taking a deep, steadying breath, I grabbed my big mag light from under the seat and stepped into the shadows. The drag marks were easy to follow at first, gouging a muddy trail into the undergrowth. Then the rain started to erase them, and I had to crouch, scanning the ground for any sign. Twigs snapped under my feet, each sound echoing through the silent forest and making my heart jump. My flashlight beams swung wildly, 
cutting through the darkness, but illuminating nothing but trees and dripping leaves. The deeper I went, the more that dread settled into me. I knew I wasn't alone. I could feel eyes on me, watching from the shadows, and I wasn't talking about deer. Then I heard it a lone moan, barely audible over the rain, filtering through the trees. I followed the sound, the flashlight beam trembling. The moan grew louder, turning into choked gasps and sobs of pain. And then I found him. The man was crumpled behind a thick stand of pine, his clothes torn and soaked with blood. His right arm ended in a ragged stump just below the elbow, a crude bandage wrapped around the wound. But it wasn't the missing hand that chilled me to the core, it was his eyes. Wide, wild, reflecting the beam of my light with an animalistic terror. I knelt beside him, trying to sound calm. Hey, it's okay. I'm here to help. The man flinched, his breath hitching. No. No, can't go back. He mumbled, his words slurring. Who did this? I asked, panic rising in my voice. His gaze darted around, seeing things I couldn't. He'll, he'll find me. I looked around the woods my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. Whoever had done this was still out there. And whoever it was, wasn't human. I needed to get this man out of here. Can you stand? I asked, looping his uninjured arm over my shoulder. He grunted and heaved with the effort, almost toppling me over. Clearly, he was in shock and barely able to support his own weight. I tightened my grip and somehow managed to drag him half-stumbling, half-crawling out of the trees. Adrenaline and fear gave me unnatural strength in that moment. Back at the truck, I found my first aid kit behind the seat. It was basic, but I managed to clean the wound and wrap it as best I could. The man moaned in pain, his eyes squeezed shut. It wasn't enough, he needed a hospital. We have to drive, I said, my voice hoarse with urgency. Hold on. I'll get us out of here. I helped him into the passenger seat, wincing at the bloodstains he left. Then, with a last, terrified glance at the woods, I started the truck and pulled away as fast as I could. The rain had eased off to a drizzle, and I had the wipers on high, struggling to see the road ahead. The man next to me whimpered and mumbled incoherently, his head lolling back against the seat. I drove, my knuckles white on the steering wheel, trying to push the images of the woods and the severed hand out of my mind. After what seemed like an eternity, I saw lights in the distance, the telltale signs of a town. Hope flared in my chest, and I hit the gas, speeding down the rain-slick road. The first building I spotted was an old, brick-faced diner with a flickering neon sign. I pulled into the parking lot, grateful for the sight of other people. Stay here, I told the man, my voice shaking. I'll get help. I dashed into the diner before he could reply. The warmth and smell of greasy food enveloped me, a stark contrast to the chilling night outside. A few heads turned at my frantic entrance, water dripping off my raincoat. An overweight waitress, her hairnet slightly askew, frowned at the streaks of blood on my shirt. Phone, I gasped. I need to call 911. She pointed vaguely behind the counter, and I stumbled towards a grimy payphone mounted to the wall. My trembling fingers struggled to dial and I cursed the slick buttons. When the operator finally answered, I blurted out my location and the situation, my words tumbling over each other. Minutes later, the wailing siren of an ambulance cut through the night. Red and blue lights flashed against the diner windows, and paramedics rushed inside with their kits. I watched as they took over, loading the injured man onto a stretcher his face ashen under the fluorescent lights. 
A police officer approached me, notebook in hand. He was young, barely out of the academy, I guessed, with a look of earnest determination. I retold my story, my voice still shaky, omitting the part about the figure in the woods. That sounded too far-fetched, too unbelievable even for me to comprehend fully. He jotted down notes, frowning intently. You say his hand was severed? Clean cut? I nodded, the horror of it all hitting me again. And you're sure there was no one else out there? He asked. I hesitated, my mind flashing back to the wild eyes of the injured man. I should say something, mention that this might not be an accident, but the words stuck in my throat. I didn't see anyone, I said finally. The officer scribbled a few more things, then closed his notebook. All right, Mr. Matthews, you've had a rough night. Why don't you get cleaned up? and we'll talk more when you're feeling a little calmer. I did as he suggested, washing off as much blood and grime as I could in the diner's dingy bathroom. When I returned, the ambulance was gone, the flashing lights swallowed by the night. The officer sat at a booth, sipping coffee. He motioned for me to sit opposite him. I've got a car on the way to take you back to your truck. We'll have someone tow it to a garage for now. You can file a report in the morning. Give us a more formal statement. I nodded numbly, still trying to wrap my head around what had happened. A wave of exhaustion washed over me. All I wanted was to sleep and forget this whole nightmare. The officer drove me back to the empty gas station. My truck seemed strangely out of place in the quiet darkness a beacon of normalcy amidst a night of madness. He handed me a card with his name and number on it. If you think of anything else, Mr. Matthews, anything at all, you call me immediately, he said, his voice serious. I stumbled into my truck, locked the doors, and collapsed into the sleeper cab. Despite the fear and the lingering adrenaline, sleep dragged me down like a riptide. The next morning, sunlight streamed through my dirty windshield, and for a moment, I almost believed it had all been a bad dream. But when I turned the key in the ignition, the engine roared to life, a grim reminder of the very real nightmare. At the nearest police station, I filed a report with a tired-looking detective who took down my story with raised eyebrows and the occasional muttered, "'Jesus Christ!' They impounded my truck for evidence, assuring me I could pick it up as soon as they were done processing it. Over the following weeks, I followed the case as best I could through local news reports. The injured man, whose name I never learned, remained in critical condition. Police suspected foul play, but there were no leads, no suspects. Eventually, the story faded from the headlines and I tried my best to do the same. But it clung to me, a shadow I couldn't shake. The severed hand was never found. The gas station off that desolate stretch of Carolina Highway was shut down. Rumor had it no one would buy the property after what had happened there. And as for the man whose life I saved? Well, he lived, but I heard he was never the same. They say he rambles on about things he saw in the woods, things no one believes. I believe him. The aftermath was a chilling reminder that the world holds terrors far greater than any campfire ghost story. Sometimes the real monsters walk on two legs. And sometimes, a familiar stretch of road can turn deadly in the blink of an eye. That night, evil had a face, and it was as human as my own. My name is Rick, and this happened to me in the summer of 1994. I worked long-haul routes as a truck driver, which meant nights alone on the road, a lot of coffee, and a lot of sameness. Some guys complained, 
but I found something reassuring about the steady thrum of my rig, the black ribbon of road disappearing beneath the wheels, mile markers ticking by. I was on the last week of a three-week haul through the American Southwest, Phoenix to El Paso, El Paso down into Louisiana, then cutting west before finally swinging back north up into the Rockies where I'd get routed back to the main terminal in Utah. The desert was on my left, mile after mile of scrubland under the pitiless sun. The A.C. in my cab barely managed to keep the sweat from trickling unpleasantly down my spine. Ahead, shimmering in the heat, was a sign for gas and a truck stop, a welcome sight. I'd need to top up my tank and maybe grab a bite, or at least use the restroom in a building more substantial than the fiberglass shell on my rig. I signaled, and the truck lumbered across the cracked asphalt of the exit lanes and into the lot. The place looked abandoned, faded paint, a sagging roofline, cracked concrete in the parking area. Even the tumbleweeds seemed to have given this place a wide berth. Probably another victim of the interstate, I thought, pulling to a stop beside the pumps. I climbed out, the heat like a slap across the face. The stillness of the air was unnerving, no hum of traffic from the freeway, not even a hint of a breeze. After fueling, I headed inside. The silence grew more oppressive. Inside, the shop was deserted, no cashier behind the grimy counter, only a faint stench of something gone bad and the buzzing of flies around the hot dog warming under its glass dome. I walked around, peering down aisles lined with dusty products and sun-bleached magazines. A prickle of unease itched at the base of my neck. Hello? I called out. No response. Something wasn't right. I decided to cut my losses, heading back to the door. As I passed the counter, a flicker of movement near the magazine rack caught my eye. Maybe this place wasn't so deserted after all. From my angle, I couldn't make out its shape, just something thin and hunched on the floor, like a large, discarded sack. It twitched suddenly, a movement that was way too jerky to be natural. A chill ran down my spine. Then, it lifted its head and I froze. The face that stared back was a nightmare. It was human vaguely, but twisted and gaunt. Hollow eyes, skin stretched tight across bone, like a corpse left to dry in the desert. It bared its teeth, uneven fragments in a lipless mouth, and let out a rasping hiss. I didn't stick around. I bolted for the door, slamming into it frantically. The lock was rusted, unyielding. I pounded on the glass, yelling for help, but outside stretched only that empty expanse of sunblasted lot. Then I heard the scratch of movement behind me and spun around. It was crawling towards me, dragging itself over the linoleum with unexpected speed. Those vacant eyes were fixed on mine, and I swore something resembling hunger lurked in them. I scrambled backward, eyes flashing to the counter where an ancient-looking tire iron rested. It was a long shot, but I grabbed it, brandishing it like a weapon. The thing kept coming, hissing, the sound a grotesque parody of a snake. I swung the tire iron blindly, more out of desperation than strategy. It connected, the dull thunk sickening, but the creature hardly seemed to notice. I swung again, and again, driving it back, and then I was through the door and sprinting across the lot. My keys! I'd left them inside. I spun in a circle, heart pounding like a jackhammer. No other vehicles in sight, just this desolate, abandoned place and whatever the hell that thing was. I ran for my rig, fumbled the key into the lock, and swung myself into the cab. I slammed the door and locked it, fumbling with the ignition. My sweaty fingers slipped on the key twice before it finally turned. The engine roared to life, and I threw it into gear, 
tires spitting gravel as I sped off towards the freeway. In the rearview mirror, the truck stop dwindled. I didn't stop, didn't slow down, until I'd crossed the state line and was well into the night. I finally pulled over at a proper rest stop, breathing ragged. I climbed out and vomited on the gravel, shaking and cold despite the residual heat of day. I never went back to that place, never looked it up on a map, never even spoke a word about it. To this day, I don't know what I saw. I don't know if it was real. Maybe a hallucination brought on by too many nights staring at the road. Too much loneliness and caffeine. Maybe something else, something the rational mind rejects. Either way, sometimes when I'm on a stretch of empty road, my gaze lingers on the exits, those lonely outposts promising food and fuel and a break from the monotony. And a part of me remembers that parched truck stop, that crawling shape with its hungry eyes, and wonders just what else might be lurking out there in the vastness of the American desert. My name is Russell Banks, and this happened to me back in September of 2011. I drive a long-haul rig, crisscrossing the country for a moving company out of Tulsa. Most hauls are boring, days on end staring at the highway with nothing but my thoughts and the occasional podcast for company. Sometimes, though, things get interesting. Interesting in a way that makes your guts clench and your neck hairs stand on end. My life on the road means my diet is mostly whatever I can grab at gas stations. I was getting sick of jerky and microwave burritos, and my gut was making its displeasure known, so when I saw a billboard advertising, Evelyn's Home Cook in Exit 52, my stomach won out over my usual skepticism about roadside diners. Fifty miles later, I pulled off the interstate and found Evelyn's nestled at the edge of the Texas panhandle. It was a classic diner, chrome siding, a faded neon sign, and a parking lot full of pickups and dusty sedans. Inside, the smell of bacon grease and coffee mingled with country music twanging from an old jukebox. The place was packed, mostly with locals, farmers in worn overalls, a group of teens in matching letterman jackets, and a few weary-looking travelers like myself. A waitress with a tight perm and a name tag that read, Jolene, showed me to a pleather booth and handed me a laminated menu. I ordered the chicken fried steak, figuring when in Texas, right? While I waited, I made idle conversation with the trucker at the next table, a burly guy named Dwayne who talked a mile a minute about his grandkids and the sorry state of Texas football. Jolene brought my food, and for a moment, the cares of the road melted away. The steak was crispy, the gravy thick and peppery, a damn good meal even without Evelyn's reputation. I was halfway through feeling content for the first time in a long while, when I noticed it, a hush descending over the diner. People stopped talking mid-sentence, forks pausing halfway to mouths. The jukebox crackled and went silent. All eyes were on the front door and a figure that had just stepped inside. I followed their gaze, my fork clattering to the plate. The man was tall and wiry, his frame hunched as if from the weight of an invisible burden. A tattered flannel shirt hung loosely on his body, and faded jeans were streaked with dirt and something darker. His face was deeply tanned, lined like an old map with a wild, bushy beard that hid most of his features. But it was his eyes that drew everyone's shocked attention. They burned with a fierce intensity a mix of desperation and a chilling emptiness. He didn't walk so much as stalk across the diner, his gaze sweeping the room. An uneasy murmur spread among the patrons. Duane looked over at me, his jovial expression replaced with grim concern. That fella ain't right. 
he said in a low voice. The strange man stopped at a table occupied by a young couple, their road trip smiles frozen in place. He leaned close, his voice a rasp that carried through the tense silence. See my boy? About this high brown hair answers to Benji. The woman shook her head, her eyes wide. The man repeated his question, a desperate edge in his voice. When they denied seeing his son again, he slammed his fist down on the table, rattling the silverware, and moved on. A wave of fearful whispers rose in his wake. I thought about my own kid back in Tulsa, a freckle-faced eight-year-old with an obsession for dinosaurs, and the same boy's name, Ben, echoed uncomfortably in my head. Someone ought to help him. A woman at a nearby booth murmured her voice laced with pity. But no one did. They watched, with fear and unease warring in their eyes, as the desperate man questioned everyone in the diner. He left the same way he entered, his stooped shoulders disappearing through the door. The tense silence hung heavy for a moment longer before the chatter slowly resumed, though the carefree atmosphere was shattered. Jolene cleared my plate, giving me a tight-lipped smile. You finishing that pie, honey? I shook my head, the image of that haunted man burned into my mind. I paid my bill and left Evelyn's, the taste of chicken fried steak turning to ashes in my mouth. Back on the interstate, I scanned rest stops and gas stations, half expecting to see that hunched figure, his desperate question hanging in the air. News reports popped up on my radio, not about a missing boy, but about a string of disturbing incidents in the area, stolen livestock, ransacked sheds, strange sightings in the scrubland at the edge of ranches. Some dismissed it as coyotes, others whispered of something less explainable. I kept driving, the miles blurring together under a sense of unease that wouldn't fade. Something was out there. Lurking in the dusty Texas backcountry, driven by a desperate, almost feral need. And out there, somewhere, maybe there was a scared little boy named Benji. Days turned into a week, and I crossed into New Mexico. I found myself avoiding the backwater diners, opting for the generic fare at truck stops. One evening, parked up and scrolling mindlessly through the news on my phone, a headline made me sit bolt upright. Child's remains found in Texas Panhandle. My stomach dropped. They hadn't released a name, but a cold certainty settled over me. That man, his haunted eyes, his relentless search. It wasn't the face of a grieving father anymore. It was the face of something far more dangerous. I called the local sheriff's office listed in the article. My story sounded garbled even to my own ears, a roadside diner, a strange man, a feeling of unease. The officer on the other end was patient, but I could hear the skepticism in his voice. Look, I pleaded, that man, there was something wrong about him. I don't know what he did, but I know he's dangerous. The officer sighed. We're investigating all leads, sir. If you see him again, call immediately. I hung up feeling hollow, a gnawing guilt clawing at my insides. Should have done more back at Evelyn's? Could I have prevented it somehow? The questions wouldn't leave me alone. They say time heals all wounds. That's a damn lie. The man from Evelyn's diner haunts my rearview mirror. Sometimes... Late at night on a long haul when the exhaustion seeps into my bones, I swear I see his figure shuffling along the roadside, eyes blazing in the darkness. My name is Sam, and this happened to me in the fall of 2008. I was a long-haul trucker then, crisscrossing the country. It was more than a paycheck. There was a thrill to being on your own, the rhythm of the road, 
just you and your rig. Most of the time. My son was born that same year, and suddenly the open road felt less liberating and more lonely. But we needed the money, so I kept those wheels turning. One route took me up through Wyoming, a beautiful drive if you're a fan of wide open spaces. And I was, mostly. But some stretches felt too desolate, too much of nothing in between those scattered towns. This particular night, I'd opted for a secondary highway rather than the interstate, hoping to save some time. Turns out, it wasn't the smartest decision. For miles, it was just me, the beam of my headlights, and the moon hanging huge in the sky. Then, from the side of the road, I caught a flicker of movement in the scrub. I hit the brakes, heart thumping. An animal? Maybe a deer or a coyote, but whatever it was, it darted back out of sight. It wasn't until I'd stopped completely that I realized the shape was too big, too upright, to have been an animal. I told myself it was fatigue playing tricks on my eyes. I rolled forward, scanning the roadside. Nothing. Shaking it off as nerves, I continued at a reduced speed. A mile down, it happened again. This time, I saw it clearly, someone standing stock still in the brush, watching me pass. And I could swear it was facing the wrong way, head twisted around. A prankster trying to give me a scare? Out here, it was more chilling than funny. I pressed down on the gas, putting a few more miles between myself and whatever was back there. But the uneasy feeling lingered, growing worse with every passing shadow. Up ahead, a cluster of lights broke the monotony, a little town, or maybe just a roadside diner. Hope flared. Maybe some hot food, even just a bathroom break, would break the tension. The place turned out to be a gas station a lonely outpost with too many dim bulbs and a buzzing neon sign. There was one other vehicle parked beside the pumps, an old van with peeling paint. Two teenage girls were hanging out beside it, smoking, and the sight of them should have been reassuring. But there was something off about them, in their fixed smiles and two bright eyes. My earlier unease returned with a vengeance. I fueled up fast, but something made me linger by my truck. In hindsight, it was the kind of dumb choice that only happens in horror movies. I peered down the road, trying to see if there was anyone, any sign of movement, out there in the darkness. I still don't know why I didn't just get back in my truck and drive. That was when I heard it, a rustling from behind me. I turned. Two figures were emerging from the shadows by the back of the gas station. One was short and stooped, moving with a strange side-to-side -side shuffle. The other was tall, freakishly tall, its limbs too long and too thin. And that was my cue to finally make a sensible decision. I ran for my truck, fumbling with the keys. The figures were closing in, the tall one moving with surprising speed. Somehow I got the door open, threw myself inside, and slammed it shut. The two of them converged on my truck, pounding on the windows, and that's when I saw it clearly. The taller figure's face, twisted and wrong, pressed against the glass. Its eyes burned into mine, empty and black. And in that instant I knew, with bone-deep certainty, that these weren't just some backwoods weirdos. There was something else, something hungry. I fumbled for the gear shift, throwing the truck into reverse. The thing clawed at my door handle, teeth clicking inches from my face. I stomped on the gas, tires squealing as the truck lurched backward. In the rearview mirror, I saw them standing side by side, watching me go. I put as much distance as possible between me and that godforsaken place. My hands were shaking so badly I had to pull over and throw up on the side of the road. When I could drive again, I didn't go back the way I came. I kept driving north, 
the adrenaline coursing in my veins, making sleep impossible. By dawn, I'd hit a major highway in the relative safety of other travelers. I called my wife then, shaky and incoherent, telling her I wasn't sure when I'd be home. She was used to odd hours, but something in my voice scared her. I promised her I'd make it up to her, to her and our son.